All right, so we are going to talk about the continuous improvement planning process. My hope is to provide an interview, uh, an overview for you, and then we can get going. When Kari and Brian and I met to talk about this upcoming meeting, we thought that maybe because it's not a typical SLO presentation that we could attempt a slightly different protocol. So this is a modification of another school reform initiative protocol. Um, it'll be a little more open-ended so that you all as board members can just take a turn to share your reflections. These are some guiding questions, um, but it's just, it's a little looser yet still focused. So um, we'll take it from there. So <laughs> where to start? Um, I, th there's a lot of material in this presentation and, um, and there were a lot of links. I think in thinking about this presentation, I wanted to make sure that you had the information you needed as board members to understand what the continuous improvement planning process is. Um, how the AOE defines it, what the requirements are for us as a school district and as individual schools. And, um, and so I put a lot of links in here. I also really wanted to make sure that you had the opportunity to hear directly from our principals about this, which is why I embedded those links. Um, they were good sports and recorded those Flipgrid videos, but we're not gonna take the time in this meeting to go through all of that. We, we would never get done. So I think that, um, you know, I was searching for some sort of um, visual to, to show the manifestation of continuous improvement in action. And this one, while the language is slightly different than the AOE's language, what I like about it is that it emphasizes the idea that we're always doing sort of little cycles. We want to try something small, you know, look at our data, plan to do something, do it, check in, is it working or not, and then we're going to act. The way that the AOE talks about action right now is either in these short cycles, we're going to abandon an idea because oh, it didn't work. We're going to adapt it, um, tweak it a little bit, or we can adopt it. And that with each sort of PDSA cycle, um, we see little bits of improvement. Uh, I remember when I was getting initially trained in, in this sort of theory of thinking, we talked a little bit about um, Kaizen, which is sort of that Japanese model of uh, improvement, sort of those small steps to ultimately making powerful um, changes and permanent changes for the better. So I, um, I just want to let you know that all of this is here. The other thing is that the process can also be incredibly complex. And we're going to talk through some of the phases of the work. So when I had the opportunity through Dodie's uh, designation as a school in need of comprehensive supports, when we had access to AOE resources. And so um, we capitalized on that opportunity and invited the creators of this particular uh, comprehensive improvement planning process to come and facilitate for us. So it was great. Then it was nothing that um, seemed too overwhelming to us as administrators who have lots of work that we're doing in our schools. And for the AOE, it was an opportunity for them to come to the field and, and really enact and experience this process. So that was super helpful. Um, I think the other thing I would say is, as Floor mentioned, we had probably all together about 50 ish people, I think, who gathered. We met at Dodi. We were able to meet twice before our period of school dismissal. And, um, and I'll get into those details in a little more detail momentarily. I think when we were planning, Kari had asked, um, what is it really? What, what does it look like? And so the, the, the easiest resource for you to see, and I clipped a little bit of it along the way and embedded parts in the slideshow, is that CIP template. That's sort of the overall template for the four phases of the process. So that link should work for you. That framework is a 50 plus page document that articulates um, expectations. I'm gonna move on. And again, because I'm sharing my screen, I can't see everybody. So if you have a question or you want to pause, I think we have time for that. So by all means, just, just pop in because I won't be able to see everybody. 
In a nutshell, uh, there are four phases of the continuous improvement planning process. And I took these visuals from the AOE's materials so that um, you had an overall picture. That's what's on the left there, those four phases. Um, we last spring together as a district, both sort of together as a district or an LEA, um, and in our separate schools did the assess needs and innovate part. That's when we engaged in our comprehensive needs assessment, looking at lots and lots of data and came up with some change ideas. We're now in phase two. We're testing out a few ideas and seeing what might work um, and what might need to be tweaked and what just doesn't work at all. And then ultimately we want to um, do more intentional implementation and then spread whatever that small PDA, PDSA cycle was, plan, do, study, act. We want to grow it and then ultimately make plans to sustain it. And it's just, it's another approach to sort of organizational change theory when we're in sort of early use and ultimately we want to get into routine use. There are on the right there are two figures. The first is again, a little bit more detail about um, what is involved in a plan to study act cycle or a PDSA cycle. And then I also included just that figure four up there, just so that you're aware, we are required by the AOE to have both a school district plan and school-based plan. It was really important um, to me as the facilitator, but I think to all of us in our district that there was very clear alignment between those school-based plans and the school and the school district plan because we work so hard to, you know, articulate student learning outcomes for all of our students to engage in PD that's relevant for all of us. So if we had had vastly different plans, that would be problematic in my estimation. So we did a lot of work together, some um, where we were able to mix up and work in teams across schools. And then when it came time to ultimately come up with change ideas to do a little bit more school-based work. So again, this was um, essentially the, the work of our very first phase, the work that we engaged in together last year. So we looked at data. I included the data for you in the slideshow uh, coming up and, um, and came up with some broad areas of focus, a priority problem. We did a lot of root cause analysis. Why do we think that this particular problem exists? Um, and then we came up with a, an idea for change around this theory of improvement. We had gotten to about the second to last, last stage, and then COVID hit. And I um, can't even tell you, you know, I felt this pressure and urgency and need to, to get this work done. And at the same time, knew that people didn't have the capacity or bandwidth to get it done. Ultimately, we met via Zoom in school-based meetings. I said by the end of May, and we, we did our very best to articulate an idea, knowing that we had no idea what school was going to look like when we all came back. This is phase two. Um, and so really thinking about enacting these cycles, tweaking them, um, thinking about the professional learning and the communication that staff members need. What are the sources of data that we need to collect? How do we know if this change idea is working or not? And again, um, ultimately adapting, adopting, or abandoning the change idea. This is um, sort of the highlight of phase three right, that we want to go from sort of small scale change to broader implementation. And then phase four is thinking about, okay, the things that are working well, how do we sustain them in the long term? How do we commit to them? I know for me, quite honestly, one of the things I worry about in my own practice, an area of improvement for me is that part, is sustaining it down the line. Um, I know when I was preparing this uh, this work for you all tonight, Kari asked, well, what's the timeline? Like, is there a, how long does, are each of these things supposed to last? And there really isn't a timeline. It's an expectation that we're engaging 
in continuous improvement planning work and we have to update our CIPs at least annually, but um, there's no timeline. Like by the end of the 2021 school year, you must be ready to go to phase three. Nothing like that exists right now for the AOE. So again, this is more detail than probably you ever want to see, but these are highlights from all of the work that the 50 or so of us engaged in last spring. So um, if you have, and, and if you have questions about any of this stuff, by all means um, ask, but I wanted to make sure that you had access to all of this information. So the agendas, um, and the slideshow, the data, and I see your hands raised. I'll talk, call on you in just a minute. Thank you. Um, the slideshow with all the data that we looked at together last year, the roles of the folks who are there, and then the AOE, bless them, created this voiceover PowerPoint for us because we couldn't meet in person for our last meeting. And so they packed a ton of information in that slideshow for us. Anna, what's your question? question? So I'm just curious as we're going through this, is this relating a lot to like proficiencies and kind of making that a real thing or is this different? So that is such a good question. What we hope is that it actually all is related, right? So that when we think about proficiency-based learning and our student learning outcomes, our graduation requirements, personalized learning, social emotional that it all connects and that it's meaningful um, because if we do this outside of that or separate then it just feels like it's an act in of compliance and there have been times when it has been that in this district i will be totally upfront about that right now we were looking at the data that we had we also wanted to do this now because um, as you know the board is poising itself well to engage in a strategic planning process. And I think our hope would be that when we've articulated a strategic plan, the CIP and the strategic plan will be completely aligned um, so that we're focusing on one, um, one body of work, perhaps with multiple goals, right? But that, so there's coherence in the system. Does that answer your question, Anna? Yeah, well, that's starting to, that's good. Okay. All right, so um, here is uh, where we are right now. Um, I had provided for you just a quick video overview of phase two. I also did that to model the expectation for the principals when I sent this out and asked them to do it as well. So um, you're gonna notice a, a, a fair amount of redundancy um, with some slight changes um, or variation, I guess, in the change ideas. And so, um, really elementary, we wanted to focus on mathematics. I know that, that has been an area of concern for our board in the past, as well it should be our performance overall in math. And, um, and we chose to focus uh, on grades three through six as measured uh, by the Smarter Balance. And our change idea was that we needed to be more intentional about providing professional uh, development for our teachers. Last year, we adopted a new math program. We, um, we piloted iReady, which was the companion to ReadyMath. It provides both a diagnostic assessment and opportunities for individualized instruction. And this year, we went full scale iReady, and we needed to provide more professional development. That um, SNP that I included here is just a blurb from our in-service day so that you all are aware that one of the ways that we were meeting the needs of this plan were, um, was to provide PD to, um, to all of our teachers of mathematics. And that happened through the company, Curriculum Associates, um, in October. And I'm in dialogue with them now about how and when to do the next round of PD so that we can um, we'll have our, the results of our second diagnostic. The winter window is opening for our elementaries um, now and middle and high school a little bit later. So that now if we have fall data and winter data, how do we act on that to ensure our students' performance? Uh, one, co one complication, not an impossibility, but a complication is that 
we don't have another in-service day that we can designate for this that's within a window. So um, I'm gonna have to get creative with them about how and when to do it. Um, <laughs> also, because we, we have a shortage of substitutes right now during the pandemic. So I also don't, don't wanna pull teachers out because I won't be with staff classroom. So I'm, I'm working on that. So the next number of slides are all elementary focused. And, um, and so I just wanna make sure, we're not gonna belabor the details of the slides, but my intention here was to share with you the fact that again, we're focusing on our students' mathematics scores. Um, we, I put the percentage in there of the students who are pro, uh, proficient or above. In 2018-19, as you know, we had no testing last year statewide. So those are our most recent results. The other thing to know is that the, st the state was seeking a waiver for testing this spring that they did not get. So we are planning to, to test this spring and do the SBAC. Given the period of school dismissal that we experienced, um, I don't know yet what to expect. We also um, have been told that we need to test all of our kids in person and as you know, a number of our students aren't attending school in person, they're attending school remotely. Um, and so we're, all of us administrators are just getting our heads around this. This is relatively recent news and trying to figure out what the implications will be for us. Where you can see some um, variation is in what the change ideas were. And in part, those change ideas are um, slightly different as they should be because we wanted them to reflect the local context and what seemed most important to the teams of, in the schools who were attending. So um, again, the, team, the principals, some school board members, some parents and or community members and teachers. Uh, participate and some paraeducators actually also participated. So that was Berlin. Hey Jen. Yes. Quick, quick, quick question. So looking at this goal, it, it's it's fairly specific, but I don't have a good sense of like the timeline again. That that you know the time, and so um, how are people thinking about it? Is this like an every year we're going to make progress or? five years from now we want to make some progress or, or no what's the deal? we thank you Kari. we want to make progress every year um we know that it's unrealistic to go from you know 40 percent to 90 percent in one year that seems unrealistic but we would hope to see progress along the way every single year that would be our hope and expectation okay thanks uh, can, can i ask a related question this is joe sure, Jill. Um, so I, I was just wondering if um, so the, I, I, I too was struck that the goal didn't seem time specific and also that there isn't a particular target that you're shooting for other than just an increase. And so is that something you talked about in terms of setting something a little more specific than just more? Yeah, we really wanted to have a little bit more um, baseline data for in, on the one hand so that we could set realistic goals. We also, um, some schools had more robust conversations about this than others. And, and this is, we have these conversations at school, like some, some people feel really strongly like, we have to say 100% because we are about each and every kid. It is unacceptable to not reach 100%. And other people are like, that is unrealistic right now over to, and if we set, like we need to set a goal that we feel like we can really achieve given the resources and our, the knowledge that we have. and. If we don't set it, that's going to be demoralizing and that will set us back. So ultimately, this is what the school teams had settled on. And Jen, isn't it also, it's a different approach. It's that continuous improvement. So it's, if you go back to that plan, do, you know, it's, it's the yeah, hope yeah. is that you'll keep ratcheting it up as you're doing that, that it's continuously. Um, so it's that expectation of, of those short bursts of checking in, not waiting for the SBAC only, but the short right. bursts. Right, and that's why, you know, you'll see ideas about um, the iReady diagnostic or formative assessment data or making sure that kid talk is happening. Those things that are smaller scale um, because we wanna be able to check in. You know, there was somewhere embedded in all of these materials, I think in that big video from the AO or the big PowerPoint from the AOE was, 
um, an example of really small incremental changes, like even like, okay, I'm going to go in and I'm going to have this meeting and this is how it's going to go. And then I'm going to take a minute to pause and tweak it a little bit based on my reflection and then it's going to get better. And I mean, so smaller things to ultimately um, lead to bigger and better changes. Jim, can I discuss a follow-up question? Sure. So uh, on that, so I, I have sat in those meetings, uh, not at school boards, but in healthcare settings where people have that 100% versus actually what are we trying to do right now fight. So I've heard that one. Um, it's silly in my opinion, but whatever. <laughs> like, um, uh, but what is often helpful is it's really hard if you only have an outcome goal right? Because you only measure the outcome on a very infrequent basis. So it's very hard to do true PDSA when the only thing you're measuring against is a, a big outcome. And so it's more helpful. And it may not be relevant to um, education in the way that it is to healthcare, but there are actually, you know, evidence-based process changes that can be made that le should lead to the improved outcome so that you can measure whether you're actually doing the process work along the way on a much more regular basis to see, and then hoping that it works on the outcome. But if you only measure the outcome, it's really hard to do PDSA. It's just not realistic because the measurement is so infrequent. Yeah, yeah, no, thank you. And Jill, we're all getting, um, we're all getting smarter about this, trying to figure out what is working, what doesn't, like how do we make it relevant, right? Because if it is only the SBAT, right? Like that, it's just not compelling enough or motivating enough when we've got our kids right in front of us every day and we're trying to help them make growth. Yeah. So the rest of these ideas are similar. I just, I'm aware of the time and I wanna make sure you all have plenty of time to speak. So stop me if you want to, otherwise I'm just gonna keep going here. And again, where, where it says phase two current state, each of those things, if you didn't click on it yet, that's just a short video from each of the principles. Um, and then finally, uh, U32. U32 was slightly different. We had a lot of, um, we had a lot of students who for many, many reasons last year um, had not uh, met the expectations in their courses. Um, during the period of school dismissal. And it was really important to us to not penalize our students in any way because of circumstances that may have been completely outside of their control. And so we had a lot of conversations with um, at U32 about how to provide more flexibility and time um, and at the same time promote our students' uh, growth. And so we ended up, um, students had the, the opportunity to have in progress scores at the end of the year. And then we wanted to make multiple pathways for them to resolve those in person scores. And so there were, you know, there were, we hired people over the summer teachers to check in with kids and, and do give assignments and have feedback. We had a one remote summer school opportunity around financial lit, as you're aware of. We had um, additional time and support as late as this fall. We also ultimately gave kids a choice, like here's where you stand right now. If you're happy with this and you don't want to do more, just that, then so be it. So, um, so that's sort of what that change idea was so that we could resolve in progress. And the idea of in progress scores um, and just more flexibility around that time has actually been a really um, welcome conversation. Again, in a proficiency-based system where time should be there, uh, you know, a variable, uh, we're continuing to think about that. So the next steps, and this is an important part here, so we'll continue to engage in those PDSA cycles. We're collecting data, we're analyzing it. We're getting smarter even about, for example, a growth report that we can get in iReady once we have a third data point. So we're trying to figure, you know, play around at some of our schools with what could that third data point be in order to make sure that we can chart, you know, predict our students' growth. Um, and then here's the, this last bullet point is an important one. So the AOE very recently completed their annual snapshot. 
and released data that indicates that we have um, schools that are in need of equity supports. And actually all of our schools except Doty have been identified as phase one equity supports, um, essentially meaning that we have performance gaps as we've known for a long time. It formalizes the fact that we have performance gaps between students of various um, historically marginalized groups. In some cases, it's free and reduced lunch and students who do not qualify for free and reduced lunch. Um, in some cases, it's students on IEPs and students who do not qualify for IEPs. Um, and in some cases, it's a, an amalgamation of that historically marginalized group because our end sizes are so small um, that it's hard to sort of publicly disaggregate that data. So what one thing that that means is that in this next revision of our continuous improvement planning process, we have to dig into that data a little more deeply and we have to establish a goal and change ideas that are related to safe and healthy schools. Right now, all of our um, data are, or all of our um, goals are in the domain of academic proficiency. And so next time around, we're gonna need to pull it together and focus on safe, healthy schools. This is work in which we are already engaged right now. So just so um, you have an idea, we are, um, you know, Kelly came and, and talked to us about the annual performance review for the for special ed, that report. And there are, um, we're doing some examination of the work of our students' performance differences, um, if they qualify for IEPs or don't. We're engaged in that work right now. We are, um, there's a group of students and teachers who are deeply committed to studying um, racial equity and other diversity issues. We're actually about to launch a class in two weeks, which is exciting in the district. Uh, we're engaging in, in that work at in-service days. So um, we'll, we'll make sure that, um, that we pay attention to what we're doing and we think about other things that we need to do. And then finally, um, I think the, the role for the board, I think from my perspective is to continue to um, focus on achieving that goal that you've set for really understanding our student learning outcomes so that you can take a really um, wonderfully active role in monitoring and asking us questions and supporting through the budget and everything else, all of those goals that we are expressing for our students. Um, and just please participate actively in the CIP process and in the strategic planning process. Um, the final two parts tonight, and Kari, I'll pass it to you in a minute, is just to hear from each of you um, about what's on your mind right now. Those are some guiding questions related to what we just heard about. And then I'm gonna just quickly preview, um, you know, making sure there's time to figure out what we're gonna share with the board and how and when you as an Ed Quality Committee would like to receive updates about the CIP. So Kari, do you wanna facilitate this part of the conversation? Oh. I'm on, I'm on mute. Um, I was hoping you would, Oh, oh well, well, I guess if it's open-ended. It's open-ended as long as we just make sure we hear from each board member. Okay, okay. Well, um, maybe we should do a go round. Does anybody wanna go first and just share their reactions using these questions as prompts? Let's take a minute each or so. Uh, I can go first. Oh, go ahead. Oh, you go. Go, <laughs> um, go ahead, so, Diane. Yeah, so it's, it's very affirming to, um, you know, it's kind of that old adage of teaching an old dog new tricks kind of a thing that um, every year or thereabouts, we have to go through this um, improvement process. And so it was, um, I appreciated kind of the new take on some of it and the connecting to, um, as what Kari and um, Jill are saying, connecting to that continuous, um, really taking a look at a time frame. So even if the process didn't necessarily connect a time frame. that making sure there is some way of identifying that um, so that you know, like you're saying, Jill, if it's not the short little bits, then you don't, you never feel like you're making the progress because it's too, too long down the road. So, um, and one of the wonderings was, as you were mentioning, um, Jen, about trying to find that um, PD time to look at things and that 
that that's really, <clears throat> it, it's always that balancing act as to how do you maintain that time of instruction with our learners, but then also finding the time to do that important reflective work so that you know you are on the right track. Um, and so just wondering, um, once we get out of COVID uh, times, how we plan for that so that there's the support for the teachers as to how to best continue that reflective cycle to continue to do it. Great, thanks, Diane. Floor, you ready? Sure, yeah, I, I think I found my notes, just that I'll try to remember the questions in order. So it, what was affirming to me was uh, uh, hearing from the principals. I, I think I got every principal, I mean, I didn't get to the U32, but I listened to all of them and was affirming to hear everybody talk about the kid talk, what, um, and then the, the excitement of everybody uh, around the CIP continues to be uh, really exciting. So, so that was affirming and the triangulation of data that was also really <laughs> affirming. Uh, what, I, what I wonder, I had a couple of wonders. One was uh, it's, I think just two of the principals talked about creating a more formal way of talking about kid talk. Is that all across or is it just in one school or a couple of schools? That's a wonder. And maybe I got that wrong. And maybe you have the answer right there. <laughs> Do you want me to weigh sure. in or no? So this Go ahead, Jim. Of, yeah, thanks, Kari. Um, one of the things that we're talking about, and Diane, I appreciate that you just talked about sort of post-pandemic, right? Like the, some yeah. of the conversations we just had were some of our schools, in part because of their size, are well poised for kid talk because there are mm -hmm. enough people to get around the table to yeah. actually do it and to create schedules where we can make that happen. And in some of our smaller schools, it's like one or two people would be sitting around the table. One of the silver linings I think of this experience is that we've become really, really good at meeting virtually. Um, and sort of, so that whole idea of geography being an obstacle, it's no longer an obstacle. So if we can coordinate schedules so that the, for example, primary teachers at Romney and the primary teachers at Doty <laughs> have a chunk of, of time to, that, that's available together for them to meet, to engage in some of this work, that would be awesome. Those are the kinds of conversations we're starting to have. Okay. That's, that's great. And then the other wonder was uh, when, I think this was back when we were doing the CIP process and I didn't quite see a reflect that or maybe I just missed it, is uh, we're, you know, we're improving every year, right? And then we talked a lot about creating that multi-year in, and I know we have to focus on something, but one thing that we felt is that we couldn't just do math, <laughs> that it had to be literacy and math. So all of the data that I saw was just math. So just trying to bring that up. Uh, uh, again, uh, uh, and then uh, uh, the last wonder uh, uh, you you talked about it. You know, I, I feel really committed about having the diversity talks and what does that really mean for a district. And I feel like our CIP process has to have that umbrella overall for equity. Otherwise, we are really not <laughs> not a, not moving forward as a as a society or as a or, or as a group of leaders that we have that uh, the ability to have that leadership right now and that responsibility. So I feel really, really strong about that. And, and the last uh, wonder, uh, it's not, it, it is kind of related, but you explained it a little bit, but I still do not understand how we're gonna, it seems like we're involved in this process and now we're doing the curriculum assessment. And then when do we bring the group of community back together? So after we get the assessment data, it, so, you know, it, it seems like the, the principal, the buildings, each building has set their goals with their, with their, new, their new information and what they learned from the last process. But now, how does that all come together? That's just my confusion in not knowing enough about, and you explained it a little bit, and I thank you for, for that. And I know that you have a lot on your plate right now, but I still do not get how we're going to be able to create a committee. What is that committee is going to look like, right? Because I, I see again that 50 people or whatever, <laughs> being able so that the community has some ownership. That's it. Great, thanks. Um, Jill, are you ready to go? Sure, um, so I think I asked my the questions that came up for me while we were talking. 
Um, so I, I guess I would just say what was affirming for me is it's really nice to see something that looks familiar to me from my um, <laughs> my day job because I, I'm always so like, oh, my God, how am I ever going to catch up? So uh, I think that's maybe the only other thing to add at this moment. It was familiar stuff. So that was nice to see. Cool. Thank you. Uh, Anna, do you have anything? Yeah, so um, it's really affirming to kind of see the familiarity between proficiency and um, the CIP. It, it feels really, really nice as a student to see how they kind of interconnect. I mean, I see this in school a lot. We, you know, we learn something and then we, you know, have a lesson and then we go back with it and then we go forward and then bring it back again. So that's really nice to see all that. Um, I'm curious just in general with the I guess testing and trying to get like the higher uh, percentages with like the math scores how are we going to actually go about that and what's within the other like subjects also is it you know training teachers like a different way of teaching or how will we go about that I'll take a take a note to make that really clear or more clear if we can in the in the board presentation I don't think we can take much time right now but um Okay, anything else, Anna? I think that's it. No, oh, we lost you there. She said that okay. was it. Uh, yeah. Oh, so that was it. Okay, just interesting. Um, so I, I'll go. So to me, uh, affirming, like Jill said, uh, the, the, the planning process, this formal planning process included it was familiar to me. It included rational steps. It seems like it should generate good results. I think the focus on math makes a lot of sense based on my limited understanding of where where we need the most improvement, um, if you're going to pick one priority. And I really like that there's alignment across the, the district. That, that seems like a really positive step in the right direction. On the challenging side, it, this whole the whole presentation kind of reaffirmed for me like how slow it is to affect change across a district, <laughs> you know, and and um, we're talking about incremental progress in one specific area where we want to make progress, a lot of progress in a lot of different areas. So that kind of leads to the questions. One thing is I'm wondering about in and thinking of this as a warm up to strategic planning. It's like a sort of a first step into something bigger. A couple of things. One is it really makes me think think that maybe part of the strategic planning should be about identifying obstacles and seeing what we can do to remove them. And Jen, I'm glad you you touched on that a little bit when you talked about um, teleconferencing. And you know that's something that makes things easier. Uh, I don't want to only focus on the negatives and removing negatives. I'll, you know that can't be the only thing, but it does kind of call this slow progress is like what's holding us back. We got to really try to address those things. Other part of it is what lessons can we learn from this this planning process that can inform our strategic planning? Because I feel like so much is riding on strategic this big strategic planning process that we're gearing up for. Let's learn from this. Um, and a couple of things that um, come to mind are we're going to need to prioritize. We can't we can't pick everything. We can't improve in all areas. We're really going to have to hone in on. Um, a small group of things and not take on too much. That that just seems kind of clear to me at this point. So um, I had one other thing I wanted to mention. Oh, and and it, it also re, kind of reaffirmed for me that as a board and as a committee, we don't have that many opportunities to influence the system as specifically as when we're doing planning and budgeting. So as Jen was making this appeal, like get involved, stay involved, you know, that's absolutely right. And I'm, so I'm glad we're doing this work and getting ourselves ready to be involved in a more informed way. That seems important. So I'll stop there. Did, did we get everybody? Did Brian, did you, you, I don't know how much of you that you caught, but did you want to say anything? I've been catching a lot of it, but I also caught a lot of it because uh, Jen and, and you, Kari, are, are so involved uh, in uh, preparing for this meeting. But I will say that the, uh, the other piece is the other I guess I, I don't want to drop any bombs here or anything like that, but uh, the equity supports, there's an equity supports piece. Uh, I don't know if you, you talked about that or not at all. Okay, I see Jen saying yes. Okay, uh, that's a new thing that we, it came out of the Vermont AOE. And 
I have to say, I believe most or lar- many, I don't want to say most, but it may be a large majority of Vermont schools fall in this range of requiring equity supports. Now, what does equity supports ultimately going to mean? Uh, they have different levels, level one, two, three, but they haven't really identified what that means. But you know, they're putting schools into these categories. And one may assume that there may be some state types of interventions coming down the pike if schools don't do or show that they're making a headway in um, these areas. So I know that one of the things is with the CIPs that uh, Jen presented to, uh, talked talked to with everyone tonight about is we are going to have to start providing some equity uh, goals, guidance into our CIP goals. And it's very, it's, I think uh, our curriculum management review, which we're going to be starting very shortly, one of the areas that they're looking at is equity. So if there could be, we could get some uh, real inf- interesting information in that regards, and maybe that will help inform our CIP, um, our CIP process. Great. Thanks, Brian. Mm-hmm. Um, did everybody get a chance? Um, Lisa, did you want to chime in at all? Sorry, no, no, thank you. It was, it's very interesting to me, so thank you. Okay. All right, so if that's, we've got a, um, just about 10 minutes left. Um, so let's move on to looking looking at our next steps. Um, the key is what do, what do we want to share with the board in a couple of weeks? What, what do anybody, uh, does anybody have any ideas about what's the best way to present this information and, and ask people to engage with it? Any particular slides or? Anything like that? I, I thought that the the presentations by each principal. I don't. I know that we don't have that amount of time, but each one was like a mi- two minutes. It was not even two minutes. And 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 those with the goals are just. I, I think they speak for themselves. So that would be I don't know about ten minutes or twelve minutes. In and then the rest could just go in the packet because I don't know that that people would actually take the time to look at videos with the full board package that, that we have. And, and, and I think it's, it makes not just a connection with the school, but a connection with, we keep hearing from people that want feedback from, uh, from the people on the ground. And that, I, I, that's super telling. That's just one, one thought uh, to make it easy. <laughs> I like that. I, I don't know about all of them, but but like one or two get different different voices involved seems like, seems good. Other thoughts? I mean, I, I do think Jen, it would be good to get an overview like we usually do from you. But if um, obviously you're not going to be able to go as in depth as as uh, this was. Yeah, I mean, I think an overview with a, a one or two of the videos and maybe one of the goals just to show an actual goal would be great. You know, to show it written in the in the written format. What, one thought I had about this, and just tell me if this is off base, but what if we posed a question or two for board members to reflect on after they've read the material, so they can come in with some thoughts about it, just to just to try to prompt them to engage a little bit more. Um, and I don't think we'll have time to go around and have everybody respond to it, but maybe we could take one or two responses. Yeah. Does that make any sense? Yeah, especially since we could send it out, like, I mean, immediately, you know, it's not like it has to go with the full packet, we might want to spread it out so that it gives people time in between reading what's need necessary for the packet. Okay. If that, if that makes sense, I'll work with um, Jen and Brian on a, a question or two and see what we can come up with. All right, any other thoughts about that? Okay, um, let's see, where are we? Future agenda items, I believe next month we've got math, which is the big one, right? One of the big ones. So I, one of the are things we, I wanna- uh, Brian had his hand up about something. Oh, I, sorry, I sorry, Brian, well, go ahead. No, no. Mine was just uh, just another plug uh, here with the, uh, the CIPs in general, uh, as I'm learning the Vermont way of, uh, of things. The uh, CIP is a uh, very Vermont. Uh, we uh, and I, and I always what I so what I try to do is I as superintendent uh, taking my experiences from outside and trying to say well where, where if this is what 
Vermont does, what did we used to do in Connecticut or New Jersey and try to, uh, and I look at the CIP process and it look, reminds me very similar to like uh, a school's uh, school improvement plan, a, a school's uh, strategic plan. And so I know, you know, one of the big things with this curriculum review that we're coming out of the, coming out in the next uh, several weeks is we ultimately want to develop a strategic plan for the district. So I think that these CIPs are interesting templates uh, that we may want to look at or consider for um, you know, linking them. They, I mean, we would ultimately want to see a strategic plan where the CIPs kind of feed into it and the strategic plan feeds into them. So that was all. Yep. We talked about that a little bit. I think that's that's really important. Yeah. Okay. Terry, sorry to interrupt. I, yeah. It just Go Brian ahead. made me think about one one thing when you guys are thinking about the, the questions and prompt in the board, and I think I was just having this conversation before, is that what, it, what, is, what do you guys as leaders need from the board to accelerate, you know, the way you're educating us right now, but, you know, how do you prompt a question to, to get from us what you need to accelerate this process, right? To, to I hope that that helps. It's just like, you know, it's, sometimes as board members, it's hard to know what, what you want from us besides being involved and stuff, but we can also not help accelerate the process. So sometimes it's better to have some clear guidelines if, you know, or, or just make us think that way, brainstorm. Yeah. And how can we make it better? That's an exceptional question. I, I, I like it. <laughs> I don't know if we'll have all the answers for you on January, and uh, but this is something we should be definitely working towards, I think. Jen, you have a point? Yeah, Kari, the other thing I want to say is that, I, I mean, hopefully, as we continue to engage in this whole monitoring process around the SLOs, you all and the board will have the information that you have month by month about our students' performance so that it won't feel like such a separate thing or like so big, right? So when we're thinking about doing math next month, you're going to see that data in a way that's different than we just talked about it now even, right? So um, just bearing in mind as we're tweaking this process again and again, figuring out what makes the most sense for you all to feel like you are in the know as board members and you have what you need to do exactly what Fleur just said. Good. Good. Okay, well, if that wraps up that I think we're at the end of our agenda does anybody have anything else so why don't we adjourn at 555 and take a couple minute break thanks everybody yes we have a quorum so let's come to order then at 6 p.m um just like to wish everyone a happy new year whom I haven't had a chance to wish yet and um and I expect that tonight in particular, uh, many of us will have our minds drawn in other directions. Um, if I might at least be permitted a, a moment of gratitude, um, Brian pointed out yesterday that January is School Board Appreciation Month. Um, you know, I think that something is underappreciated when somebody has to designate a month specifically for its appreciation. Um, but in fact, how ordinary all of this seems, this school board work, and yet how extraordinary it actually is, representative government in action. It's amazing and it's extremely important uh, and from my perspective, when, whenever it's in trouble someplace, the best thing that we can do is to do our work as representatives of the people as capably and as honorably as we can, and thereby to give life to representative government as it is with us here. Um, so that moment of gratitude includes thanks to all my colleagues and as well as the people that we work with in the schools and thanks to all the people of our, of our district who 
are the ones we're here for, um, including, of course, our students. Um, sorry, um, had to get off that, that off my chest. Uh, once again, welcome to all, and we can move to agenda revisions. Um, Caroline, did you have one? I do. I would like to add superintendent evaluation um, in open session. Okay. Um, I would suggest putting that as 4.2 um, board operations. Mm -hmm. 4 .2 and I think um, in terms of time, I think it can just be five minutes unless there's a lot more unexpected comments, but um, I'm thinking five minutes for my part. I'm thinking 30 seconds for my part, but five minutes allowing a little bit of back and forth. Yes, um, the day I see 30 seconds in that time column is the day we really hit peak efficiency. Um, thanks, Caroline. So we have 4.2 superintendent evaluation. Um, I'd also like to add a 3.3.6, just um, a quick check with the board on a draft letter for the annual report, just to make sure that I haven't disgraced us with, um, with that draft. Love your, um, your feedback. So the new 3.3.6 um, letter for the annual report. Uh, any other agenda revisions? If not, let's proceed to 3.1. Uh, Towns and Anna, um, take it away. Awesome. So I guess the the first you know big noticeable thing is that we are we are coming. You've come back, returned from our holiday break to a brand new new year. It's uh, it's very exciting, um, uh, and it's it's good to see everyone again. Uh, and see everyone back in the building and really uh, return to uh, uh, our, you know, school life. It's nice. Yeah, so as we're coming back to school, by the end of this week, I believe our semester ends. And usually what would happen is our schedules would completely change and have different classes. And this year, because of COVID, we actually keep the exact same schedules unless we have um, one class of a semester long and then we just have a free band for that. Um, uh, uh, another very exciting thing is that, so the 10th graders traditionally do a project where they do a, um, a kind of, I'd say uh, they cover a local community issue and they write about it and they create all these reports. And pretty soon the U32 Chronicle is gonna start publishing some of these um, so that uh, you know um, everyone can, uh, there are a lot of really interesting topics that were covered this year and pretty soon everyone will be able to read what uh, the, those projects were and hopefully learn a little bit about um, issues that the grade that the, that class cares about. Another exciting thing that a lot of students are looking forward to is that the um, governor has now approved winter sports to start. So um, in the coming weeks, basketball is going to start, hockey is going to start with masks and all of the limitations, but it's really nice to be able to have some extra curricular that's not just um, hardcore school based. Yep. Thank you. Um, Thank I'm you. not sure I've ever heard the term hardcore and school-based uh, <laughs> together, but um, it's good. Uh, it, it, any, any questions for Towns and Anna from board members? If not, thank you very much to both of you, and I'm glad that you're that you're back and that you're happy to be back. Um, we're happy you are as well. 
Hope it stays that way. Um, so moving on then to 3.2 superintendent, 3.2.1 COVID-19. Uh, you're muted, Brian. Thank you, Scott. And thank you, uh, members of the board. I uh, want to also uh, just uh, express my uh, uh, appreciation for the entire school board. Uh, being a school board member is a thankless job uh, most of the time, and uh, hopefully today it's not. So thank you for uh, your help and your leadership. And uh, one of these days, we'll you know, hopefully we'll all be actually sitting in the same room together, uh, and hopefully in the not so distant future. I'll keep my fingers crossed uh, where I can actually tell you in person uh, how much I appreciate all of you uh, and your leadership during these most interesting and challenging of times. The, uh, my report on the uh, COVID update is light. Uh, there's not uh, so much going on, of course, but uh, just only as recently as about an hour ago, uh, just so you have an update, I, uh, we do have a, uh, one of our uh, schools, we did get a positive case uh, at uh, Berlin Elementary School. Uh, so uh, Principal Boynton may not be here in, uh, it, right, right now he's working to uh, pivot his school to being remote tomorrow and on Friday. We do not necessarily believe that anyone else has been exposed and we believe that everyone is safe. However, operating out of an abundance of caution, uh, we just want to make sure uh, we, 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 uh, we're doing things above and beyond uh, for make sure folks are, are safe, our staff, our teachers, our students and our communities. So uh, pr uh, at Mr. Uh, Principal Boynton will be, uh, he may not be joining us tonight because he's gonna be working getting his school to pivot tomorrow to go full remote for th tomorrow and Friday. Uh, uh, and hopefully that'll be it. But uh, if there's anything else, we will definitely let you know. The um, uh, other pieces that are happening is the, early, one of the parts of COVID-19 update is the, we've been talking about early release days. We've been, our elementary schools have been, we've worked with our leadership team, uh, talk, speaking with our principals and our, uh, the need to, whether or not we need to continue to do early release days for our schools. Uh, it does appear that the middle school uh, it may need some, we were trying to figure out that the way their schedule was made so we can uh, staff the school appropriately. We do have some uh, teachers who are uh, doing uh, teaching remote and also uh, teaching in person uh, at the same time. Uh, and so that, that does create some added complexities and they had some difficulties. And I know uh, November and December was very helpful for, for, our, for our district for a variety of reasons, but we're gonna be uh, looking at possibly uh, uh, looking at that schedule moving forward for them. I'll have to make some decisions about um, um, assigning early release days, potentially at the middle school and perhaps only at the middle school. Uh, so we'll, I'll, I'll have more information uh, over the next few days as we try to sort, sort if there's anything else that we can think of uh, to support that situation without going to early release. Because I do know, uh, speaking with members of our communities, uh, it's, and parents at the middle school, uh, parents are very happy that we're, we're offering school on a, on a daily basis. And they also know that it, it, sometimes it is challenging to do early release days. At the same time, uh, folks understand if it's necessary. And so we're, we also wanna make sure we're supporting our teachers and our students at that time. Uh, and that really is most of my uh, COVID update. Those are just the, uh, the two big things that are had been happening was uh, at Berlin and what we're thinking about at the middle school. Thank you, Brian. Questions on this segment? Um, uh, I wonder if I could ask one, please, Brian. Um, has the state been in touch regarding vaccinations and the school as a site for, um, for vaccinating students, employees? No, we have not heard anything on our end. Uh, the, the, we did receive more information about our uh, our uh, the state's program to test our, our faculty members uh, for who may who, the, we call it the asymptomatic to see if anyone's asymptomatic. Uh, the last time we do that at least once a month with the state. That's going to be happening next week again. Uh, the last time we did it, uh, we uh, had zero cases, so we were very happy uh, to know that our faculty is. Uh, really doing their part to keep our kids safe. Thank you very much. Excellent, yeah. Um, 
Uh, last chance for questions before we move on. Seeing nothing, Brian. Oh, yeah. So, so the next one is just the administrative searches update. Uh, I'm not, there's a uh, just gives you a timeline in the packet for the business administrator and director of IT. Uh, these are two big positions. They're two big uh, leadership positions in our district. Uh, and uh, just as of right now, uh, I have uh, over 20 applicants for the IT director. Uh, there are uh, we're going to be uh, starting the process to begin screening those applicants, starting to uh, develop an interview committee, and uh, hopefully identify a suitable candidate for our district. Uh, the other piece of it is uh, with regards to the replacement for the business administrator, which is also a uh, very big uh, big shoes to fill. As of today, we have six applicants. Uh, and they have uh, they're all in they're from in and around Vermont, but also outside of Vermont, as we recall that that is a national search. So we're up to six. So uh, we only had three a few days ago. And now we're up to six. So uh, and that closes in at the end of January. And uh, we will then, of course, um, begin that process for uh, interviewing uh, and identifying a candidate who is uh, worthy of uh, working here in Washington Central. Thank you. Stephen. I'd just like to take a minute to commend Brian and the administration on um, looking for candidates in um, uh, untypical locations, particularly um, targeting two minority administrative um, organizations for their input or suggestions on possible candidates. Thanks, Stephen. Here, here. Um, Thank you. Uh, any other questions or, or comments for Brian on this particular segment? No. If not, I I I do have the class question. size update letter. Uh, I don't know if that just just want to point everyone out that uh, we uh, pursuant to board policy, uh, the board did pass a policy earlier this school year. Uh, about uh, ask, asking uh, the superintendent to work with the leadership team to develop uh, class policy sizes, uh, and we did do that. So it's in the it's it, the class size guidelines. Again, these are guidelines, uh, but the, we do have them now uh, for this year, and this is what we what we have them based on currently. And this was a collaboration uh, with our leadership team and uh, the superintendent's office in developing these. This is something I think we're going to continually have to look at as our enrollment continues to fluctuate. Uh, right now, we, we do know we have a declining enrollment. Uh, so the class size piece is something we're definitely gonna be continually monitoring um, as uh, our enrollment numbers uh, change. Diane, then Lindy. So one question I have before we launch into the next portion of the budget, because to me, it was helpful to see that um, that uh, agreement or you know the, the thinking around the class size. But what I was wondering as we look at some of the different um, changes that might be occurring, uh, I wondered if there was any conversation or if there's any um, information to be shared about caseload sizes for special educators. Um, so I was just wondering, um, that would be helpful to me as a board member as we look at different options that you know of how things are shifting if i understood also what that vision is and the decisions around caseload size i i know uh kelly bushy and i we talk about caseload sizes uh especially when we were doing this work around class size guidelines i don't know if kelly would like to uh talk about the uh the actual uh some of the things that we did talk about and the caseload sizes sure so as you all know, and I'm sure can understand and appreciate that when we say that there's a caseload of 10 students, that um, can range in terms of workload and intensity very drastically, right? So one student on an IEP, that workload for that one student is very different than another student. And so we use um, what we call a weighted rubric and I work with the special educators to um, weight each of the students on their caseloads um, on a scale of one to four. 
um, with some very specific criteria of what each of those numbers means. Um, and we have said um, in working with some of my colleagues across the state, right, what, you know, what is an average caseload? And many people use the, uh, this rubric or a very similar one um, to determine what is an average um, workload or caseload size for special educators. And we say that that ranges anywhere from 30 to 35. But again, right, schedules, small schools, lots of those, all of those things have an impact on how it is we can create schedules and the workload for special educators. But that is the area that we try to target is that 30 to 35. Um, and again, we are very close to that across the, every school. Um, and it ebbs and flows and changes from sometimes from day to day. <laughs> um, but we do look at that every year and we have trends of that data for the last I don't know, five or six years. Diane, did that answer your question? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Kelly. Thank you very much. Thanks, Lindy. Excuse me, mine actually went back to the job search. I forgot to ask this. I noticed it says establish interview committees and I'm curious change in leadership and whatever, um, what you're looking at as far as interview committees, what the makeup of those would be. Yeah, thank you, Lindy. Great question. I'm glad you asked it. The uh, my, my big uh, piece is I just want to honor the district's practice of formulating a, uh, a diverse committee that represents different stakeholders across the district. That's the ultimate goal. And following that district practice that has been in place. Uh, and so, uh, you know, if, 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 if folks are interested, uh, definitely, uh, especially members of the board are interested, please send out a, a letter of interest to uh, HR. Uh, that's Carla Messier. Thank you. Um, any other questions for Brian on, um, might as well be on his entire report before we move on. Um, I see none. So um, that brings us to finance committee. Uh, oh, sorry, Caroline. I, there. So, I that, don't know if I was wait. frozen. <laughs> oh, oh, okay. Um, <laughs> My apologies. So I had a. I do have a question, but it's a. It's. Um, do we, as a board, select who we would want to be represented on the hiring committee, or do we just let board members send the? letter of interest yeah, what, I, I, would, has... I, I would ask that the board member send a letter of interest to the to Carla Messier okay great thanks for that clarification good uh, other questions if not um, finance committee floor do you want to lead this one sure Good evening, everybody. It's a happy King's Day today, too, to, play to your celebrations today. <laughs> I, I, there, there's a lot of things that we look through when we're looking at the budget, and I'm not sure that going through the order that we have in the agenda is the best way. I'm going to summarize it as best as I can. In the, the leadership, I would want to be not the only person talking but I want to put uh, three remind you know four rem five reminders of what this budget is. I know that we all read the package, but uh, the overall uh, budget is uh, a goal or five guidelines for the board so for all the members that are here to that the impact was less. The impact on taxes was less than three percent or three percent. Find ways to fund three initiatives, the strategic planning process, the facility director, and the health instructor in uh, using fund balance if appropriate. And then the prepare a, a list of contingencies if needed, establish a budget that is uh, less than the excess spending a threshold per equalized pupil, and establish a budget that will move towards supporting a strong multi-tier system of supports. So page six, we received a letter from the leadership team and Brian, and they tell us that it meets the needs of students, preserves programs that meet the needs of all students and the right size of school personnel, and reduces expenses, supplies, and contracts. 
I'm wondering if uh, Brian or any member of the leadership team want to talk or if that explanation members. I know well, some of you were anxious to hear more. Well, I mean, I, I appreciate the leadership team uh, drafting that letter uh, and sharing it with everyone so that uh, folks understand that it was uh, there was input from f multiple folks. It wasn't just uh, one person making the uh, decisions or anything like that. It was it was a lot of different uh, folks coming together. And uh, the, and I think the leadership team really wanted to do this. Uh, a lot of questions were asked by the board members uh, last um, at the last meeting. And I think the leadership team really wanted to make sure that uh, all voices were heard and that uh, we did follow the same collaborative process that we've had that uh, the district is accom accustomed to uh, in past in the past year years. I don't know if anyone from the leadership team wishes to add anything. I see so we have some members here. Maybe the letter speaks for itself. <laughs> Okay, I see camera on. Yeah. Okay, I'll go. I'll go on. I, as a board member, I, I really appreciate it, and as the facility chair, as the finance chair, I really appreciated the letter because it really showed that it was more of a, you know, bottom up decision making that top down. So it was it was great to receive that. So if there's no questions about that, uh, we move to page eight uh, to review the budget. But before we get budget, we have some logistics to talk about. It, it, we realized we had said that we were gonna have another informational in, in, input informational meeting with the community because can you hear me okay? I, I hear, I see something, okay. So it, due to the timing when we need to put the, the warning out, it, when we were doing our plans, uh, Miss, uh, um, we really look at approving this budget tonight and moving into having informational, uh, continue, continue to have the informational meeting on the team, but it will be more of an informational meeting rather than an input uh, meeting due to timing. So when you're having our discussions right now, I just want you to have that in your mind so that you're looking at the budget through that lens. So having oh, said Laura, that, I'm to, gonna- yeah. Sorry to interrupt you. Um, yep. At what point yep. will you want a, a motion to approve the budget? So I, I, I think I think I would like a discussion. I have the questions in front of me, but I think I would like to have the, the to be fair to the board members. I would like to instead of in our usual a with you, a, sir chair, a, to to have Lori explain. Uh, uh, not explain, but have Laurie give us the highlights that we agree on uh, about the budget, then make a motion and then have a discussion again, just to be fair to, because as the finance committee, we did that ability. And I know that they all trust us, but otherwise I feel that it's not, since we're surprising everybody with this decision found out on Tuesday. It, can I just eat thumbs up? People are okay with that? Caroline? Okay, or you're asking a question. <laughs> I, I was asking a question. Uh, if I have a question yeah. about the letter that was in the budget, did you want us to ask it now or to wait until the end? Um, whatever you prefer. But I did have a question about the letter that the administrator signed. I think you can ask the question about the letter right now because I was assuming that we were done with it and then move into the budget is ahead. Yeah, I meant the the letter about the budget that gave the update and then had all the principal oh, okay, signatures. Okay. So after, to wait for after, that one. After that. Perfect. Yes, Thanks. wait for that one. So Lori and Brian, I'm gonna give you guys to just do a quick update, especially on the three K. <laughs> First, I was just gonna ask Brian, did you wanna do your part first and then I'll jump in? Sure, absolutely. I can do that. Uh, and so, uh, and I, you know, I was going to talk a little bit more about the leadership letter. So this is, uh, you know, I know that the uh, the board, uh, you know, ultimately that uh, what what have we done? What have we done since the last um, 
uh, budget draft number two. So what, what, what we did, what I did is I met with each principal individually and then as a group uh, so we could talk about and discuss how we could obtain the $300,000 budget reduction. Uh, and uh, after meeting with the leadership team, uh, we did decide that it was unanimous that we would make this reduction. And there's full four bullet points on here um, you know, that are on the uh, letter. I'm not going to, you know, you, we can talk more about the letter if uh, folks want to talk about the letter. But uh, uh, they, they, the leadership team uh, did put those pieces here. And very, and it talks about what they, what those are. Um, they, you know, that we also do realize that we, you know, we are in challenging times. Uh, and you know, moving forward, there is a desire to evaluate programs and look for, look at our structures for effectiveness, effectiveness and need. Use the uh, findings from the upcoming curriculum review to ensure uh, that we're meeting student needs in the most efficient way possible. Planning uh, for a steady decline in enrollment. Uh, or developing ways to market our schools to new and to new families, so we can try to get more children and families enrolling in our schools, moving into our communities, uh, and of course, uh, just looking also at ad addressing growing needs of families. Uh, uh, I know Kelly, we talked about the, the numbers of on the caseload, right, and the, the numbers, and we do have a uh, we do have a declining uh, student enrollment, which includes special ed, but we also have rising costs in special ed. And uh, one of the pieces there is, why is that? Well, you would think, oh, well, we have less special ed students, we would have less cost. But if the special ed students have more, um, if they have more or greater needs, sometimes that doesn't necessarily mean just because you have less means you're, it's, you're gonna have to spend less. Uh, and so look, looking at how to form strategic partnerships with uh, community agencies to also as a way of, uh, of uh, being, uh, uh, as physically responsible we, as, as we can be with our taxpayers' uh, funds. Uh, so that was really, uh, you know, the uh, the big piece. You know, we're hope we're looking at this budget again as not impacting services and programs to children. Uh, we do again. I, I have to keep mentioning this, and I sound like a broken record, and I'm sorry for that. But declining student enrollment that is something that we are definitely continuing. Uh, that that you know, that's the one thing that keeps me up at night is you know that that number because less students does mean less funds from the state. Um, we uh, also were very strategic in this budget. Uh, since last spring, we did not fill every vacant position uh, that was left in the uh, uh, previous year's budget that carries over into uh, this year's budget. And so uh, what we are able to do is really continue to monitor and review every position uh, before we post them. And because uh, we have, and we have to align that to uh, student needs as a result of this declining enrollment. So, uh, you know, that's really uh, a lot of the pieces here that, uh, you know, I, I was prepared to talk about. I do know that, uh, you know, we're trying to also be very physically responsible in this time of uh, a pandemic where lots of, lots of our community members we know are going through some difficult times. And, uh, you know, we, we're, we're trying to put our best foot forward here that's going to, going to continue to how, allow us to offer the best programs we possibly can for our students uh, in, a, in, a, in a climate of declining enrollment and declining revenues. And uh, one thing I didn't, well, before I get into one more thing is, uh, I know the big hot topic from the last uh, budget uh, meeting we talked about um, was this three hundred thousand dollar budget reduction? So how was that attained, right? So if you look on page nine of your board packet, uh, that was uh, listed here. So uh, I'll just go through them real quickly. We were not filling two vacant positions. Again, looking at the, that practice of not we if we have a vacant position, you may not have to fill it if you, especially if you don't need it, but it's in the budget. So uh, we uh, were not filling those positions, eliminating the, those positions from the budget. Not restructuring special education services to include a full-time social worker uh, that is considered eligible for reimbursements. Uh, and that will uh, ultimately uh, help us get, basically get some additional funds by making a special ed social worker who works uh, with special ed students will help us get more reimbursable funds. So we're not, uh, we're not, we're getting additional funds for that way. Utilizing fund balance, uh, looking at uh, fund balance to cover rev cover the uh, cost of early retirement expenses uh, in the budget. And uh, the good news, some, and uh, Lori did provide uh, me with some good news. 
uh, over over as early as the, the break uh, for, uh, over, the, over the holiday break that the, we, we learned that the transportation reimbursement from the agency of education, we're going to get some additional revenue. So that becomes a, uh, some, uh, some fun, additional money that we were able to apply to the uh, $300,000 uh, cost. Uh, so, you know, it's, 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 I feel like uh, it's been a challenging budget. It's, a, it's been stressful going through these reductions. I know there uh, folks have had a lot of questions about how this additional $300,000 uh, was attained. And I hope that this really helps provide more clarity over uh, that, uh, that particular line item uh, that we discussed. So, uh, Lori, I can turn it over to you. So I was gonna um, ask that you turn to page 12. And that is the page that gives the change summary um, from the current year budget to the future budget. So. Um, one of the things I realized was that the board gave quite a bit of feedback on the format the last time. So I'm sorry the last time the budget draft two didn't have a lot of clarity to it, but it does now, I think. I received feedback not only from the board, but from the principals on how we could better tell our story with this budget and what has changed. So one of the things I wanted to let you know was anything in white means it did not change since draft two. Anything in yellow means it changed since draft two. Um, everybody with me so far? So um, the negotiated items didn't change at all. Um, the other staffing changes, I worked really hard with everyone to try to put in words, what are the final changes to this budget? Um, so you'll see that from the people accepting the early retirement program, we plan to have 4.4 FTEs of those positions um, not be filled that um, results in a savings of 391,000. As Brian mentioned, um, since the spring, we haven't been hiring for every single position and we have a number of positions from even this past spring that were unfilled. Some of them we thought we still might need in the draft two budget. And by the time we got to draft three and the principals went line by line for each of their schools, um, we found that we had 6.3 FTEs that are currently unfilled and primarily uh, due to attrition. So we have a savings there of 476,000. We had noted this in the last budget, but I put FTEs to it. Um, we have staffing who are eligible for grant funding. So that amounts to 2.3 FTEs. Um, the dollar amount didn't change, but I just wanted you to know that the note changed so that you could see how many FTEs are actually getting transferred to grants. Um, the next item is more of a clarification and it had all been accumulated in the last budget draft. This year, we've had a number of new hires that have not taken, for example, a, a family health plan. So we've saved money this year. We've also had staff turnover savings um, because we haven't always hired someone at the high end of the scale when the person that they filled was there. So this year we've saved 149,000 and that rolls into next year's budget as, as a savings. Um, the next two lines did not change. Um, and then the last line, we actually added a social worker and special education. So there's 2.75 new hires, um, 2.75 FTEs, excuse me. Um, and so we put the special ed position in um, and we anticipate saving money throughout the system to help pay for that in addition to getting reimbursements of a 56% from the state. So. You can see what changed on staffing. If you go down to non-salary items, some of you had been asking uh, for clarification on special ed. And so I tried to break it out into two lines. The first line is um, the state place students who have left the district. Um, so we lose 100% reimbursement. Um, and so you wanted that separate. So I put that separate. That's a, that's a reduction of 238,000. Um, the special ed tuition and uh, professional services is still saving money. It's saving actually a little bit more than the last draft because of the uh, social worker um, hiring that we're planning to do. So having said that, those are the expense changes. Right now we are asking for uh, 445,000 less than we did last year for the voters um, because the warning includes the expense total. So last year we had asked the voters for 35 million $430,502. If this budget was approved tonight, we would be asking for 
984-949. As Brian noted, we had a few revenue changes and um, you can see in special education, we're still um, projecting less revenue than the current year, primarily due to the state place students. Um, however, we are, um, it's better news than it was last month because it was actually a, a, a larger decline last month. Um, it changed actually by $63,000, excuse me, 71,000 to the good. Um, Cause last month it was, it was over a hundred thousand for the special ed revenue reimbursement reduction. Um, the other piece is the transportation aid. Um, we had thought that we might need to reserve fund balance because last year we didn't spend um, as much on our busing contract um, and the state gives you a reimbursement for that two years later. Um, the good news is the, Everyone in the state spent less and they've redistributed the revenue to actually give us a higher reimbursement rate, um, which generated $11,500 extra for next year's budget. And then the last item that Brian alluded to was um, we have about $144,000 in this budget for the early retirement program. And this reflects the fact that um, we would use fund balance to support the budget. Um, for this year, and we would expect to do that for the next year after. And um, at that point, the expense would come out of the budget and the revenue would go away. So it would have a net impact on taxes of zero uh, two years from now. So all totaled, um, the net impact on taxes is 1% less um, than what we had this year. It's 355,000 less. Um, it doesn't generate a tax reduction um, because of state components and factors, uh, but at this time, um, this is the budget that the administrative team supports. And I, I really believe it's probably the best we can do at this time for uh, what we know for students needs and programs. Yeah. And I just wanna also piggyback off of what Lori said. Uh, you know, yes, it's, uh, we're asking for less funds from the uh, local taxpayers, but, but I also think it's also important to uh, uh, point out that the uh, we're, we're uh, really trying to uh, you know we can only control what we can control right so uh, there is only so much that is in our control uh, with our with, with the way the system works so you know for example much of the you know the income in the common level of appraisal uh, it, it, it impact it does impact our local tax rates and some of this comes from the state you know so we're we're trying to work with you know within our own what we have control over. Uh, and you know some of our expenses, but we don't control all the revenues that do come in from the state. Uh, that's that that is uh, you know part of the state function of our of how our budget works. So you know we were really trying to uh, do do our, what's best, keep our keep a level services, which is one of one of the big parameters in this budget, uh, while also uh, trying to make sure uh, that we were also uh, being responsible to. Uh, uh, our, our, our local communities, especially during this time. And I just wanted to touch on pages um, 13 through 17. Um, at our last meeting, we had discussed the fact that our format for the town report had mirrored the old supervisory union format. So in the past, you would have seen like one line for curriculum services, one line for special education, one line for fiscal and the superintendent office. And what I did was I went back through all the, the years since we're a newly merged district and made sure we were comparing apples to apples by year. And you will see enhancements in particularly curriculum services on page 14. Um, so instead of just seeing a grand total, you'll see the breakdown uh, by salaries, benefits, et cetera, just like you do for other departments. Um, you'll also see that on page 15 for the office of the superintendent, um, and for fiscal services. Um, we received feedback from the finance committee that I had tucked the COVID expenses as an aggregate under the board. Um, and so the feedback I received was before we would print this for the voters, um, we would pull the COVID expenses out and put it at the very end of the report as its own like department, so to speak, so that it's easier for people to see what's going on with COVID. Um, and then the last area is on page 16 on special education. If I had broken it down to the same salary and benefit level, it would have been several pages. 
So instead of giving you one line, I did add um, an administrative department like the other administrative departments on page 17. But on page 16, I tried to break it down into a format that we use for reporting to the state. And if you feel you need more detail, I guess I would like feedback on this report before we go to press. Um, the Finance Committee looked it over and the only feedback I've received so far was about the COVID and pulling that out um, as a subsection. So I guess that's my report on the actual budget. Um, do you want me to keep on with fund balance floor or what are we doing next? I, I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wait on that if that's okay with the board. And at this point, I would like to make a, a motion so that we can now have discussion just as the board. So I would like to move that we approve the, uh, the budget for year 21-22 in the amount of 34,984,949 dollars. Thank you, Floor. Floor moves. Is there a second? Carry second. second. Very good. I'll let you run the discussion, Floor. Is that all right? Yeah, yeah so totally. Uh, Caroline? Thanks, Floor. I had a question. I think it's all directed at you. And then if anybody else is a better person to answer, that would be fine. But I'm curious if the Finance Committee had requested the letter that starts on page six and the signatures are on page seven. Um, and I'm asking because if, if there had been a concern that the decisions had been top-down decisions or there wasn't a collaborative process, um, the letter to me would not be something that I would consider evidence of full collaboration and so of decision-making. And so I'm just curious um, we, why, we how all the we, signatures ended up on the letter and just how statements about, you know, unanimous, was that something that we were asking for? Um, it, it just feels a little, I just have those questions about it. Thanks. Yeah, and uh, you know, obviously I did not write that letter, but I think the, imp the input that we did give, so we ask for a letter as a finance committee, but we did give input back to, to Brian and say, you know, we want to make sure that this is a bottom-up decision not a top-down decision. It, we, we knew that they were still having conversations because we didn't know what, we, all we knew is that we knew what 90 of those 300K were. So, so we did give some feedback to them. So what conversations they had as a leadership team, I can't speak to that. So I let Brian is, is speak to that. So I, I think he was just, they were reading in what our input was from the last meeting, but uh, Brian or the leadership team, if they yeah, wanna so, uh, uh, yeah, reflect so, on that. Yeah, so basically what I could say is uh, from the last meeting, I think uh, there was a, what I was, you know, I'm, I'm the new guy in town, you know, I'm the new, uh, the new superintendent here and uh, going through the first time bud budget process here in Washington Central during a very innovative, interesting, challenging time in our district's history. And uh, one of the things that, one of the takeaways from uh, the last uh, budget meeting with the board was that, uh, you know, was this a collaborative process? And so, uh, you know, we brought this back to the leadership team and I can let members of the leadership team, I know, you know, talk about, you know, you know how this letter came to be, uh, but you know, ultimately this letter came from the leadership team. This was, uh, this was not an idea that came from me. I could say that. <laughs> I can't take responsibility for the uh, letter. I can just talk about, uh, you know, that where, why I can't, you know, the leadership team wanted to uh, uh, put this letter in. They had, they had offered it in one of our meetings because I think the idea was we had heard they, that we had heard that, you know, it's important that uh, board members wanted to know it was a collaborative process. But I mean, I don't know if, uh, I, don't know if I know Stephen, uh, you know, played a role, a big role. Where I don't know if uh, other members also sat there in the, uh, help put this help draft it and if anyone else wants to uh speak up <laughs> i just want to add one thing just for the board members to know that steve uh, steven dellinger Pate did attend our finance uh, meetings that with us uh, just to say uh, i don't know i see many leadership team i don't know if anybody has their hat he uh, even became the host of the meeting at a yeah. point 
So, um, so I would just offer that. Um, so the leadership team met after the last board meeting because um, I, I will be to be very honest, we were not in full agreement on uh, what we uh, wanted from the draft two budget. Um, but we, uh, we, when we came together to talk about the draft three and what we, uh, what we wanted to place in there and what were some of the changes that we wanted to make, um, we came to a consensus on the, the cuts or the unfilled positions, things like that. And then uh, myself and uh, Gillian and with some help from Lori so that we had the right numbers, we weren't missing anything there. Um, we, we put together a first draft of it, shared it with the entire leadership team so that they could make any comments if there was anything that they didn't agree with or didn't, um, uh, didn't think that we'd expressed well enough. And then we, uh, then we forward that on to, uh, to Brian um, for him to include with this, uh, this packet from the, from the whole leadership team. Um, and so I, I think our goal was just to show the board that, you know, we were thoughtful about this process, that we were concerned. I mean, you know, anytime that you are reducing a budget um, from what was started as a level service when we started talking to, to where we are now, you know, there's always concern that there would be uh, cuts that would be uh, detrimental to any one particular <laughs> school or one particular program. And I think that uh, through our conversations, I felt comfortable that I wasn't harming any programs at my school, um, that these were some necessary uh, reductions that we could do so through the attrition and that um, we could then um, present a budget that was fiscally responsible. And so that's where I landed. And, um, and I had hoped that I expressed that through the letter and my part of the writing of it. And then that the rest of the leadership team, I, there were no objections. Uh, there were a few minor changes uh, from people. Um, and then you see it in that form. So everyone saw that letter before it ever got to the board. Um, we would never publish anything from everybody with a signature without everybody having input on it. Great, thank you. Is that sufficient, Caroline? Any other questions? Good, great, great. More questions before we give it back to Scott to vote <laughs> with the motion on the floor? Floor, can yeah. I ask a question? This is Lisa. Will you tell me the amount again? Yeah. Was it 34 million, nine. Yeah, and I said it wrong when I was 30. Yeah, 34 million, 984,949. Okay, thank you. Sorry. I was trying to say it in Spanish before, and I, that was what was coming. <laughs> Jill. Jill, go ahead. I didn't hear you. Um, so I, I think this question got asked the last time and I'm still, I, I'm still just making sure I'm tracking because I do think this is something we're gonna get asked as we move into budget hearings. So we have unfilled positions and we have um, uh, teacher retire the early retirements from the teachers. And I just am still not clear if it's a one-to-one -one, um, uh, outcome, in other words, Mrs. Smith retired and it's Mrs. Mrs. Smith's position that's not being filled or Mrs. Smith's retired, but we actually need to fill her position and it's really Mr. Jones's position that we want to eliminate. I'm not clear about that yet and forgive me if others are. Um. Yeah, so I, can, I, and I, and this is like one of those, uh, you know, this is a, a very difficult question to ask uh, Jill uh, because, uh, we don't have we don't, we have till April first to let our teachers know uh, you know what's happening and and uh, there are uh, some positions that you know I, I could tell you I, I'd prefer not to go through every single position because uh, that could it could change based on you know what happens between now and April first right with uh, different different uh, needs that may arise but uh, one thing is uh, you know we look at a uh, you know one of the va a vacant position for example. Uh, was a physical education teacher position that was uh, vacant from last school year and it was not filled this year. And so as a result, that's it's it's just a, a vacant position that was in the budget and that we're we're just taking out. Uh, so there are we'll probably have a better idea uh, around that April first uh, time when we get there. Uh, I, I, we did discuss this this concern. I, I do know you brought that up, uh, Jill, at, at budget draft number two. And, and I recognize that folks are going to, you know, ask questions. Uh, we did talk about that as a as a leadership team as well, and 
uh, we typically want to make sure that we're, uh, if we're, we, we like the leadership team members would, would prefer to talk to their uh, staff about any types of changes, like any cuts or anything like that, prior to uh, talking about it in a public forum, like such as this. Yeah. So, so I understand that, but it th so it sounds like though the question the answer to my question. Well, I have to remember how I phrased it. I think the answer to my question is no. It's not a perfect one to one. There might be. So it's it's a number of positions, but exactly which positions is not actually clear to us from what we have before us. And, and I'm sorry if I wasn't clear again tonight. Um, these aren't all teacher positions. So, for example, um, there are okay, 15 that's helpful. people. There are 15 people retiring. Half of them are support positions and the other half are teachers. Um, the other thing you need to know, for example, in the 6.3 FTEs, we also had a full-time administrative assistant at the central office that's unfilled. So it's not all teachers, please don't think that it is, um, but some of it is um, all over. It's not in any one building, it is throughout the system. Okay, that, thank you. It, it's helpful to at least understand what we're what we're looking at and how much we know right now versus what we may know may hear later. Any any other questions directly about the budget, Jonas, and then Lindy? Um, so you know, again, I think this is an extraordinary achievement. You know, the bottom line number is. Uh, Breathtaking, um, and it is you know the the letter of budget support is a huge huge benefit to me to see all of the names that are signed off on this. You know, hearing that it was you know hearing floor say that you know the intent was to have it a bottom up process is extremely encouraging to me. Um, Brian, I want to ask you, you know, what is the long term impact of this budget? You know, does this create opportunities to you know, to do the kinds of things that we want to do, you know, when we're not in, in COVID, you know, there's the curriculum review coming up that I think will guide a lot of the decision making around how we, how you move forward with improving student outcomes and how you, you know, reshuffle, you know, the, the deck chairs, right, to get everything more efficient and get everyone in the right place. Does this budget create opportunities for that? Is this a step in, you know, in, in those directions? Yeah, so uh, that's a great question, Jonas. Uh, the when, when I when I think about this budget in particular and what it does allow, uh, you know, obviously uh, it allows us to uh, right size our school district according to this number of students that we have that we are going to be we anticipate serving. I mean, hopefully we'll have a, a I don't want to say a baby boom, or we're we're going to have uh, folks moving into our district, or maybe we'll find out that our numbers are off and we're going to have extra students come in, uh, and that could be very helpful towards. Uh, determining what we could use our that funding for put that for i think uh knowing what what we want to do with the when we start getting into the strategic planning process following the curriculum review we'll have a better idea of actually identifying what it is we want to do uh but but ultimately the, the again the, the goal and the parameter that the board set was uh you know level service you know that was the biggest parameter so we're not really i, I don't want to say we're really changing any major things here currently uh, in this uh, in this budget, as it was a year ago, uh, except that we're just right sizing it because of the declining enrollment. Uh, yet we did add, we did actually become a little more proactive in this budget uh, with uh, the addition of the pre-K uh, uh, position and the f facilities director uh, position that will be will allow us to uh, take some of the load off of. You know, quite frankly, me as superintendent and the uh, load off of our principals. So we have more time for them and for myself to be instructional, uh, working on instructional leadership, which would hopefully help us move, begin to move the needle forward in improving our student achievement. Thanks. Lindy. Thank you. Um, the FTEs is very helpful because at our last meeting, it was it was very vague. It was just administrative cuts. And we knew that most administrators are in one building and administrative cuts sounded like administrators, even though we weren't talking about people. We keep saying we're not talking about people. So when I see over 20 FTEs and I'm wondering what our total FTEs are in our district, because we are a pretty small district, thinking percentages and things like that. So I just keep that in mind down the road um, of what it 
the impact is. I'm not saying they're not the needed. Team. And I, I was very glad to hear Stephen explain the letter because I was, um, <laughs> I was pretty frankly not believing it. So um, it was nice to hear him but, because I, I had some misgivings or some doubts. And so thank you for saying what he said. I'm still concerned about that many FTEs and just seeing where the impact is or how the impact will affect services. We're actually not cutting 20 FTEs. Thank I, you, Indy. We have 10.7 um, reduction at the top if you add the 4.4 and the 6.3. The 2.3 is a transfer of funding. The 1.9- And what, what grant is that? Um, it's um, two things. It's Medicaid and um, Title IIA. Okay. The nursing coordinators, um, we were expecting to pay for that out of fund balance. So it's not a reduction, it's a budget. Uh, it's not a budget increase. And we're actually adding 6.71 FTEs to special education. And we're adding the 2.75 FTEs in the yellow. So. I, maybe you accidentally took those as a minus instead of a plus. Well, I think the way they're written there, it is confusing. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, thank you. I'll, I'll work on that. Because we've also added the um, facilities and the early childhood and other things. So it's interesting to me that we're reducing as much when we're adding as well. Yeah, we're, I mean, ultimately, Lindy, I think we're trying to be responsive to the uh, changing enrollment of our district while also trying to be strategic in moving the district forward. And so the board can achieve its goals of a student, uh, increasing student achievement. And, uh, you know, every little bit helps. And our enrollment's been changing pretty much the same for many years as far as the changes. It hasn't been a drastic along, but it adds up. Yeah, yeah, the two year average does uh, the, the way they do the budget, the two year average. I, mean, I would love, again, <laughs> maybe you know, if anyone's listening from the state, maybe it's better to think about doing a five year average during this COVID time uh, instead of a two year average. Uh, that might be more helpful uh, with our revenues. Um, I don't see any other hands up. I know, Caroline, you had your hand up a minute ago, but now I don't see you. It's Scott. My question was similar to Lindy's, so I think I'm good. Thanks. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Scott, do you have a question or a comment? Do you uh, have a question? Um, we have a comment, I guess. Uh, comment? Do you want me to wait on your comments, Flo? Um, uh, I, sure. I, I just want to make sure that board members are able to ask. Let's just ask, make sure everybody gets a chance to ask questions about the, the budget itself after hearing Lori, and then I don't see any other hands unless I'm missing somebody in the next page. No, I don't see anybody. So Scott, go ahead. Thank you, Flora. Um, needless to say, I, I support this budget. Um, I think it's, uh, uh, to me, it's, it's like steering into a skid. Um, it lets us keep control over our future um, that we might not otherwise be able to retain if we were to, to try to fight against the trends that, that we're seeing. Um, I mean, from my experience in bureaucracies, these kinds of intentional um, far-seeing and, and controlled budget cuts are really hard to do. Um, it's so much more common for there to be a kind of um, panic throwing overboard of whatever you can get your hands on when you're just faced with a situation that you can no longer um, ignore or avoid, uh, which is a terrible way to, um, to run an organization. I mean, it seems pretty clear that it's not just student numbers, there are uh, other factors that are um, going to be stressing us in the years to come. And um, I think as a board, uh, we're going to have to take really a, a cold, hard look at 
how to shrink gracefully. Um, and I think everything is open. I mean, for example, we'll have to look at, um, you know, the, uh, the boo that sometimes verges on article of that school closing um, are the, the ultimate um, budget cutting power tool that we have. Um, we'll also have to look at, you know, reorganizing administrative responsibilities, maybe condensing them into fewer positions. And, and maybe there are other, um, you know, other approaches that we can explore as well. But the, the main thing is, I think we're going to have to start on this very early, much earlier than our, our customary kind of budget discussion cycle um, in order to, you know, prepare the ground for um, a, a rational and, and humane and, and, and collegial approach. Um, you know, with time on our side instead of working against us. Um, so that's that's one thing I think, uh, sort of a, a strategic look at the budget, which is why um, I support it. Um, the second thing is the um, the education spending that uh, the three hundred fifty thousand dollar plus cut in education spending, which is the amount that comes from taxes. Um, I think that would have to be my hard upper limit. Uh, I would not accept in this budget going above that. Um, and part of the reason uh, is actually uh, equity. Um, you just, if you compare, I'll try, sorry, I'll, I'll try to be quick with this, but if you compare, if you look at the, um, you know, our annual report for 2019, 2020, which has the tax rates from the last year before consolidation, and then, subtract these from the projections that Lori has in draft number three. Um, for say of our five towns, town A has a projected increase over those um, three years ago of one tenth of a cent. Town B, that's difference between 2018, 2019 and 2021, 22. One tenth of a cent for town A, half a cent for town B, 8.3 cents per town C, which is the median, 8.5 cents for town D, and 23.9 cents for town E. Um, that's, that's a big spread. And uh, it, it, it can't help, I think, in people's experience of, um, you know, just their, their experience as taxpayers since consolidation, um, it can lead to very different perceptions of, you know, how much headroom we might have to, to increase the budget. And if you're in town A or B, you might think, hey, we're, we're doing great. We've got, you know, we've got lots of margin for, um, for maneuver for a possible increase. If you're in town E, uh, you'd be thinking just the opposite. And I think for us as a board, um, you know, if we let our si ourselves be guided by, um, by equity, um, you know, in the plain English sense, we would not allow ourselves to add to the burdens of the worse off in order to, you know, make things better for the better off. We would, um, we would draw a line at some point uh, and say, no, we, we just can't do that. And I think the line that has been drawn in this budget is the right one. Thanks. Thanks, Scott. Yeah. Anybody else? So do you wanna take it on Scott and ask for a vote? I don't see any other oh, hands um, since we have sure. a motion on the floor. <laughs> do, doesn't anybody want to say anything? It's 35 million bucks. Right. I know I, you've thought about it a lot I guess, already. I guess as, the, as, the fine, as the finance chair, I would say that I am really encouraged by the work, especially seeing that letter. It meant a lot to me. I, I think we have been doing a lot of work when we read the book and we were trying to become a 
professional learning organization. We've been doing a lot of work to really create the culture that we want to see in all our schools. So seeing that letter to me meant a lot. And knowing that the students, uh, all the students' needs are going to be met, I'm not as concerned with the, I, I feel bad that the taxes are a disparity in different towns, definitely, but that's the CLA, that is not us. I, I see what we're doing on investment on the next generation. So it, I, I, I'm, I'm really, you know, happy for the work that Lori, Brian, and the entire leadership team and, you know, all the staff do for, for us every day. So I hope that this, uh, as a board, we're putting the resources where they're needed. And that's what I feel this budget is doing. So I'm, 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 I'm very excited and it's taking a pandemic for us to do this. <laughs> so this is great. Yeah. Um, thank you, Flor. That was very good. Uh, Kari. Thanks. Um, yeah, I'll just say that I want to commend the team for their um, thoughtful and sort of diligent work on this. Last time when we met, um, I think there was a sense that um, maybe maybe we're going too far. And um, now having seen the um, the CLA and the actual extended impact on taxpayers, I, I guess I'm left thinking, are we going far enough? Um, I, I, but I certainly support this. And um, it'll be up to us to, um, you know, explain, um, especially in, in Middlesex and Callis, why it is what it is and, and why this is a responsible budget. Thanks. Great, Kari. Thank you. Um, Diane. So, so one of the things that I, I was very concerned last month with the budget that was presented, but, but it was because I didn't see um, guardrails. I didn't understand where some of the decisions were, you know, what the parameters were around it. It wasn't that I wanted the minutia of it, but I had no idea and um, no understanding. So to me, what's helpful is seeing the class size, um, seeing also where some of those decisions are. So to me, that's the level of understanding I needed so that as decisions get made, that's what I go back to. But wait a minute, is it matching up with what we had all understood for it to be? Um, and so it, it was scary to hear all of those cuts because to me, there wasn't enough meat on the bones for me to understand um, and to be able to explain to the communities um, where those cuts were coming from and without getting so deep into the weeds. Thanks, Diane. Um, anyone else before we vote on the motion? If not, uh, all in favor of approving the motion made by Floor, seconded by Kari, um, the motion to approve our budget for the amount of thirty-four million. $984.949, um, correct, Fleur? Got that right, I hope? Um, More is nodding, so I feel pretty good about it. Okay, good, good. Um, please click yes on your um, participant screen. Um, otherwise, please click no. Um, and for some reason, I am out of a. Okay. Um, seeing only, is everybody able to to click or? Um, okay, I, I'm seeing, I'm seeing thumbs. Show of thumbs then from board members. I'm not sure if the clicking device is, is working. Um, I'm seeing all thumbs up. George, um, I can't actually, is your thumbs up? Excellent, thank you. Um, Jael, great. Okay, uh, I'm, I'm seeing unanimity. Um, am I missing anything or anybody? If not, 
Um, the motion passes unanimously. Congratulations, everyone. This is an important one. Great work. Thank you. Look at Lori's smile. Right on, Lori. <laughs> Yay. Laura, do you want to continue okay. with? Um... I'm, I'm going to continue. And now what I'm going to do, because everybody had a chance to read the packet, is just I'm going to do a few motions and then you will get to discuss. So a uh, move that, the re, that we do reserve fund balance for the early retirement program in the amount of $4,999,136. And that is I a one-time expense in case you have those questions. Yeah. Thank you, Caroline. Mm -hmm. Okay, floor moves. Caroline seconds. Discussion. Um uh, I'm not seeing any. Am I missing? I'll just quickly scan. Um I, Scott, I guess it's worth pointing out that in case you didn't see that we've, we've basically have already done this by approving the budget. We're just formalizing the, um, uh, as is our tradition. Thank you, Kari. Right, right, Kari, yeah. All right, um, so all in favor of, a, of approving the motion as made by Floor and seconded by Caroline, I guess show thumbs if you would please. I'm once again seeing all thumbs up. George and Jael, great. Um, Jill, your thumb was up, correct? Yeah, okay, very good. And I saw yours, Stephen, and Flora. Thank you. Caroline. Scott, sorry, can I ask a clarifying question? Is the verbiage for this motion in the packet or can she repeat it? Because I, I wasn't following. Oh, Lord okay. Sometimes yeah. puts the verbiage right in the packet, but I haven't found it. Yeah, I'll, I'll forward it to you, Liz, to okay. your email right now, but I can Thank read it. I can read it again. Reserve fund balance for the early retirement program. Okay, thanks. Okay. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Floor? So the, ne the next one is reserve fund balance for the COVID-19 coordinator and full-time nurses in the amount of 190,004 with zero cents. Is Sec that clear, Liz? Yeah. Lisa, did you get that? Can you repeat it? Sorry. Reserve fund balance? Yeah for the COVID-19 coordinator and full-time nurses in the amount of 190,004. Got it? Yep, thanks. That's 190004? 004, yep. Okay, great, um, any discussion? Uh, Lindy. Yeah, I just, I need some <clears throat> clarification here. We're not budgeting for these positions, but we're saying we might need these positions. And so my question is, if we're saying we might need these positions, but we put them in the budget, we can't get COVID. But if we're saying we might need these positions, we're saying we're saving this money for these positions in a different way. Is that not the same as having it in our budget when the government says, here's money if you didn't budget for it? I was I'll let wrestling Lori with that. the wording. Oh, sorry. Thank you. I, I was wrestling when we were coming up with the wording for this to say a, another um, sentence that might say subject to a reduction in CARES relief funds to add it to the motion. Um, I wasn't sure if that was necessary or not, but. Lindy, I had the same question was, should we put that in part of the motion? I'm just concerned knowing how federal grants and federal money works, that it when you say you need it, because it's an unexpected expense, and then it's shown that we think we might need it, 
right here there we're anticipating <laughs> i i just i am i'm wondering about it so i'm not an auditor though i was wondering so do you want a friendly amendment floor do you want me to type it up and send it to you or it, it, maybe lindy could um yeah uh, it's an alice in wonderland world uh for sure with federal grants um lindy if would you like to if we have this fed uh, this fund balance anyway why do we have to put anything in writing wouldn't we as a board say in june we figure we need another covid nurse or whatever next year wouldn't we then say we should look at our reserve funds to fund this and then i mean i think the way that we were seeing it lindy is that we wanted to be prepared and it helps us to to ear to earmark the the fund balance it doesn't mean that we're going to use it for that but it's by what money it, we have without you know going into too much detail but uh, overall we we felt like it would be a benefit for us to have it earmark or just to say oh i don't know that's just my question earmarking to me is budgeting Yeah, and because we don't know how long COVID is going to take, it's, it could be two years. Uh, Brian, do you want to add yeah. to that? But it could be two years. I just don't. Yeah, we well, don't want to tie our hands. Yeah. So, prepared. so I know that one of the things that we discussed uh, with the fund balance is trying to use the fund balance to offset one-time costs. And so, uh, you know, we're, we're hoping that the COVID nineteen coordinator uh, would be, you know, would be the position like that would be a one-time cost. But you know, we're not. We're still waiting for how many vaccinations. What 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 the world is going to look like. You know, we, we might not know what the world's going to look like in April, let alone uh, September. And so I think the idea was just to earmark it, uh, hoping that this may be another one-time expense. And, uh, you know, who knows, maybe through some miracle, we won't need a COVID-19 coordinator in, a, in the start of the school year next year. And, you know, trying to be optimistic about 2021. <laughs> so okay, I'll keep my fingers crossed and be optimistic. But uh, I think that was one of the big ideas there. So uh, ultimately, uh, are, did we get anywhere with this? Do, do we want, would it, would it lower our, would it protect us if we were to have that friendly amendment? Well, I have a question. I mean, if we, if we asked the board to do this tonight, Lori, uh, and if we had to make a change later for some reason, based on some new information that we find out, could we bring, we would, we would bring that to the board, correct? Yes, um, I did have in the original one that I had sent out and then it got edited um, to say subject to a reduction in CARES relief or other grant funds just as a precaution because I do believe there will be more grant funding. So now that- Lindy, do you want to do that friendly? Yeah, I emailed it to you, Floor, if you would like to okay. change your motion. And that's fine with me. Okay. Thank you, so Lindy. Let me just and thank you. go into my email, sorry. Sorry, Lisa, it just, I have to open my email. One sec. Thank you. So, do you want me to reread that motion or forward you this, Lisa? Okay, I'll just read it. Reserve fund balance for the COVID 19 coordinator, coordinator and full time nurses subject to a reduction in CARES relief or other grant funds. Is that good? Everybody okay with that? And and still in the amount of whatever? Yes, I sent you all the amounts in the email. Did okay. you get my email? Yep, thank you. All right. Um, and um, Fleur, who was the original seconder of your motion? I, I no longer remember. I believe it was Caroline. That was Caroline? Yeah. Um, Caroline, are you okay with that friendly amendment? Okay, great. Um, very good. Uh, thanks for that, Lindy um, and Lori. Any other discussion of this one? If not, we can go to a vote on the motion 
um, as we've been discussing, made by Fleur, seconded by Caroline, and amended in a friendly manner by both. Um, please show thumbs. Prove the move down if you're against. Um, I'm seeing all thumbs up. Let me just make sure. Uh, Jael? Uh, oh, yeah, great. And um, George? Great. Thank you. Uh, Winston, um, I'm seeing unanimous upward pointing thumbs. Um, if I got it wrong, I don't seem to have. So the motion carries unanimously. Thank you again. Um, so Floor, any more of these? Yeah, so the last one it, originally in your package, it just says review draft warning but we would like to actually have a motion for the warning now, because each of you are gonna to have to stop by central office to sign it. Brian, I see your hand up. Yep. Yeah, I just wanna make sure we get that change there on page 21 uh, before you do yeah, the motion. I will, I will get- oh, Okay, great, thank yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. I, I have the language here, but uh, but I just wanna make sure the board members knew because on, on our agenda, it says just review, but because we're but voting in the budget we're going to do the warning and then if brian and michelle or Melissa are going to try to schedule with everybody so that we can get this signed and that's really really important and, and if uh and if and know. we need to have this really done uh no later than uh than tuesday january 12th uh and so uh, we're really hoping that folks can stop by central office uh between 7 30 and 4 p.m uh no later than january 12th and if not uh you know, I may have to come knocking on your door to help you get the have you sign it. So you might see me for the. Uh, um, I don't know. I don't know if I'll, I'll be knocking on the door, but we'll have to find a way to get you to sign it. <laughs> so. So if you go to page twenty or twenty one, in your packet, the only change is the location from Middlesex, from town office to Middlesex town hall. That is the only change. I'm not going to attempt to read the entire warning. <laughs> here because we don't have that time but <laughs> plus you don't want to hear me reading this thing yeah. so uh, are, would you like to so, move it I, Floor? so i will make a motion to approve the warning very good uh second i'll second steven um thank you jail i i saw jail. i saw yeah. Stephen's hand up, but um, thank you for being willing to fill in the gap. Um, <laughs> any discussion of the warning? Uh, okay, in that case, all in favor, once again, please show thumbs up, opposed, thumbs down. And um, once again, I'm seeing all thumbs up, wonderful. The motion carries unanimously, uh, uh, I think. Scott? Yeah. Yeah, can I just ask a question, a, a, a clarifying yes. question? Um, so I, I heard Brian say he was gonna hunt us down for signatures and I had uh, left the video for a second and the meeting. So can you just tell me what I need to do? I just don't wanna, <laughs> I don't wanna be hunted. <laughs> sure. <laughs> so, uh, uh, and, and hunting season's all, uh, coming to an end. Uh, yeah, I, I know that as well. Yeah. So, uh, so uh, basically, uh, we're going to ask board members if they can stop by between the hours of 7 30 and 4 p.m but no later than tuesday january 12th to sign the document uh and, uh, oh, and if okay. not we'll have to make a we'll, we'll if we have to meet you somewhere for some reason it, it, we'll, we'll, we'll try to make something because uh we have to have it done and then we also have to get it out for the annual report so i mean there's a lot of other pieces to okay it. all right thank you okay I got so, it. thank you sorry about that so brian i i don't get back into town generally until 6 or 6 30 and i leave town around 6 or 6 30 in the morning so um i will need to either meet somebody somewhere or if there's an extended night um you know um, it's if i have enough time i can sometimes shift my schedule yeah. but that's really only a few days so that yeah, and, and there's there's a i have to say we have a lot of hard work in central office here as you're well no, so there's typically someone here. We just might need to know what time and day you'll come, and we'll make sure it's whoever is here. If it's me or Carlo or someone else, we'll uh, be waiting for you. <laughs> okay, great, thanks. And, and Brian, that's starting tomorrow. Like we could do it tomorrow if we wanted to. Will you be ready tomorrow? Yes. Yeah. Okay. 
Great, um, wonderful. So now uh, if we're done with the morning, which I believe we are, yes, Flo? Well, do, uh, is there any more finance committee business uh, apart from the new agenda item that I've asked for? We, we are all done. We're all done, excellent, great. Do you wanna just mention that we have a informational meeting next week? Curry. Sorry, yeah, yeah. You're on I, it. I, Go for it. Yeah, we, I had mentioned at the beginning that we were going to make that one an informational instead of an uh, input meeting. And we have uh, a plan. The uh, Lori and Brian and Michelle have helped us, you know, do the slides again. And we will have a similar present, a similar share presentation of the budget uh, next uh, Wednesday. Is that good, Kari? Yep. Thank you. Great. Um, many, many thanks to all. Um, very nice. Uh, for 3.3.6, uh, I sent earlier in the day um, a draft. Uh, there's some uh, clunky turns of phrase in it, which I hope you'll ignore, which I intend to fix and, and uh, just smooth rough edges on. But I just wanted to run it by you and make sure that um, you're okay with it, basically. Um, it, it don't, I'm not asking for wordsmithing or, or anything like that, just as long as, as you think the tone is okay, the, um, the message is okay, um, all of that. Um, that we, don't even, we don't have to vote on it. I I'm just, just want, uh, if anybody has anything to say about it, uh, I'll be happy to, more than happy, in fact, to Diane. Uh, the only thing I was noticing, Scott, I, I, you know, I like the parallels to what we're doing and how how we take care of each other. Um, my only question would be is 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 around the statements of that this is our first step in a multi year process of adjusting with our budget because I don't know what next year brings, and so if I were reading that as a community member. I might think, oh, okay, so next year you're planning on making dramatic cuts again. I, I think it misses the point you're trying to make and it sends me down a different road. So I would just kind of, you know. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I'll um, yeah, watch out for that. And um, thank you very much, Diane. Um, any, any other advice? Um, if not, we can, we can move on uh, to board operations, diversifying educator workforce. Yeah, it, Scott, I'm wondering, could we have like one minute so I can put the presentation and maybe just do a one minute break to the bathroom? Is that okay? Thank God, Flora, um, we can, let's take yeah. five minutes. You, if de you deserve, as, as you deserve just a Just to break. move the things, put the presentation up and yeah, and it's just gonna be for sure 15 minutes, but I just need to put some oh. stuff up. I had all the minus up. So just two No minutes. problem. Um, <laughs> how, about, how about a five minute break for everybody? So back at uh, 7.35. All right. <laughs> okay, well, I'm, I'm excited to, to share this report with you guys today. So diversifying the regular workforce in Vermont is, is We've been trying to make the report uh, come alive in Vermont in the past uh, in the past three months. Uh, this uh, oops, let me see if it'll let me go oh, there. Uh, so a lot of people had asked this question: Who produced the the report? And it was the New England Secondary School Consortium, and it was facilitated by the Great Schools Partnership and supported by the Nellie May Foundation. And Ventura from Massachusetts and Jess are from our own agency of education were the co-chairs of the report. You had a small but mighty team from Vermont. I, I, all of the other states had much bigger teams, but this was your mighty team from Vermont. I, the, the priority of, of the work really was educational equity with emphasis on diversifying educator workforce. I, so we, we had a lot of really meaningful conversations in this and why I'm excited to present this is because it's not really because of the countless hours of research or discussion or going back and forth to Boston or actually we we're doing a lot of this by Zoom, which at the time I really disliked and now here I am in Zoom world every day. 
um, it's because it, it represents a deep commitment and lifelong commitment to equity and anti-racism work in part of the members of the task force. So all of the all of the research and all of the uh, strategies that, you, that you're going to see in this report, I email them to you and hopefully you had a chance to see it. It's all based on New England research and New England data. So it's not far from, from, from us. Um, this is what the report looks like. If you had a chance to see it, uh, I, I can send this presentation later to you guys. I'm not gonna attempt to read the full report. Uh, but as you know, uh, a growing, uh, I'm gonna, sorry, I need to make this smaller here. Uh, I, this is what is important just to say that a growing body of educational research demonstrates the positive impacts of teachers of color on short and long-term academic outcomes of all students. We know what the data is nationally, right? So in K to 12, because not in not all New England states, they count pre-K. So by 2060, uh, the number of, uh, will climb to 66% of, of students of color in the schools, but we just have an 18% of the educator workforce is made up by people that look like them. And then it, this is my favorite part of the report and I'm kind of rushing, but it, the grounding principles was, I think one of the things that we were the most proud of it and what sort of grounds the report and the CC is not something that you have to read all at once. You can go into different sections of it. So the first one is commit to equity. Second, acknowledge the harm the system has perpetrated and continues to perpetrate. Honor identity in all its forms. Engage equitably. Be an anti-racist. Oops, sorry. Ah, how do I go back? Oh, sorry. It's supposed to have the go back. Sorry, guys. Uh, there. So I'll just leave it like that because my cursor is acting up because my hand is shaking a little bit. So measure, share, and reflect on the data and evidence of the progress and in a transparent matter. So in Vermont, we have formed a, a task force separate from the New England Consortium, still um, supported uh, by the Great Schools Partnership. And we've been having a series of, of webinars, which a lot of our administrators have participated in. And uh, Carla has also our HR director participated on, and, and Brian was really open about posting our, as you heard, our jobs in other, uh, they were a little overwhelmed by the amount of places that you can post, but they were open uh, to it. And I've been so grateful to see a lot of familiar faces from our district really engage in this work. So why I'm going to stop sharing. So the last webinar happening is in January 12th, but in the website, you can see all what has happened in November 17, November 15, and November 12th. The last webinar was going to be on cultivating the interest. After sending a survey out, we're going to continue to work more in the key strategies to promoting diverse educators and for retaining a, a diverse educator workforce. And I'm going to stop sharing the screen for a minute. And why why is it important to me to for for us to like sort of dig into this kind of work is that uh, as a board member, uh, increasing the diversification of the teacher workforce is the I think it should be part of our continuous improvement plan. We need to be preparing all our students to engage in a multicultural society. All our students must have the ability to effectively connect with people who are different from them and create classrooms that reflect the changing demographics of our country. It, board leadership matters because we get sure that we put the resource, resources necessary to support the people that have put both positional and dispositional leadership in our organizations to do this work. And then another responsibility that we have is engaging our communities in this conversation. In this conversation, it's important to advance in this work, eh, not just in our school, but in our state. And, and why? Because the, eh, we don't need to all, only work towards equity in our schools, but we need to work in equity as a community, as a, as a whole. And then I uh, have somebody else that is way more eloquent than me say why this is important too. And Joseph, help participate. 
and then we'll have room for some questions. And I believe I just had eight minutes. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Mia, and I graduated from U32 last year. Yeah, and Flora is also my mother. And I was a student representative on the board, actually. And I was also a member of BLAM, which is um, stands for Black, Latinos, Asian, and many more, and is a club kind of a group for the students of color at U32. And we were also doing a lot of racial justice work in the district as a whole. We were doing a lot specifically in U32, but we were also trying to branch out into the elementary schools as well. And when I heard that my mom was doing this work, I was really excited that it could be coming into U32 and into Washington Central as a super, or as a whole, because I think that it would be an important continuation of the work that the students of color started and that it would be kind of, I don't know, I think that the students of color started this work and said, this is something that's really important to us. And this is something that is happening to us. And this is something that's present in our daily lives. And I think that it would be the board's duty to listen to that and to continue promoting their voices. And by promoting this work and what this report is saying would be supporting the students of color in that. And I think that the board has a really unique a good position here to make the conscious choice to be continually aware of race and how it affects education, which is something that the students of color didn't have the privilege of. You guys have the privilege of having the choice to be conscious of race, and that's not something that we had, and I think that that'll be great for the school as a whole. So that's finishes the presentation and we still have five minutes for questions because I think we stayed on time. <laughs> so uh, Diane and then Kari. So thank you both. I mean, Flora, you're always very eloquent and you know, your passion shows through. And, and I think you're exactly right in both of you with, with the fact that what we had said was it was easy, not, and it was, easy for those of us who are very privileged to jump on the Black Lives Matter bandwagon, to say, yep, we're gonna fight for social justice. And then we just merrily go along our way. And so I thank both of you for reminding us, these are ways that we can really put it into action and that we are, we are called to do that. And so I think this report helps to set that stage and to prepare us for the work. So thank you both. Thanks. Kari? Uh, I had a question and a comment, <clears throat> excuse me, and um, I'm sorry I missed the first minute or two, so if you already mentioned this, um, I apologize, but do we have data for our district about the diversity of our employees or our students relative to the community, maybe? Do you, do you know if that exists? I think it's not aggregated, but I think we all know, and I would be looking at Jody or Steven and our principals <laughs> for that, but I think we, you know, it's, yeah. it's pretty small. You know how the percentage of students is. is yeah, yeah and we, we should be able to, we can pull that off IC as well, or, or you know, our data. We can, we can get that if that's something that you're interested in uh, seeing. I guess that relates to my comment, which is that I could easily see um, this uh, topic being a thread of our strategic planning process. I would probably argue that it has to be, equity has to be. And not that we have a lot of time, anybody in this room has any any extra time, but I think we have to make time to think about if that's true, that's gonna be a, a thread, it's gonna be a focus. What can we do between now and then to prepare ourselves? We're preparing ourselves budget-wise, we're preparing ourselves um, in terms of academics, um, but there's there's more we don't know than, than we do know on this topic. And so what, what can we do? Looking at data might be one thing. Hearing from Blam might be another thing. I'm, you know, I'll stop there. And, and I and I can just say, as someone who has been attending the uh, one of one of the team members from our district who has been attending these uh, the, these uh, the, the trainings that, that, that have been offered over the last course of the last month, uh, what's very interesting is it, it, 
looking at it from not just from a, a thing, a, a way of trying to get uh, in recruitment and, and diversifying and bringing different folks who don't necessarily look like you or I do, Kari, to uh, to Vermont, to Washington Central. Uh, you know, it's interesting learning that it's actually some districts have been doing that in Vermont, and, and uh, what the difficulty is after two years, folks leave, so they recruit, and it's not it's the retention piece too. So it's about creating that environment as well, uh, not just trying to uh, bring uh, bring folks into the environment, but also making that environment uh, inclusive and that folks want to stay. Yeah, yeah, that's Stephen, one. And uh, as far as they, I, I let, I, I'm interested in questions, but I can go ahead, Scott. Um, Stephen? Um, sorry, Flora, this might fall more in the statement category than question category, but... Um, that's okay. That's okay. I'm prepared for Stephen always. <laughs> I, guess, I guess I could frame this in a question. Is um, empathy? No. This, this. I, I, I want to appreciate the need for input and the importance of reaching out and uh, giving voice to everybody. But from my perspective as a board member, I think our board task is straightforward um, if we want to have anything meaningful and we need to give voice a collective voice as the school board of what our expectations are now that's not easy to do that will require more discussion but i think if if we're going to have meaningful change we need as a board to decide what it is we want to have happen, voice that so that we can communicate that to our administrators. And this is an expectation of the board and this is what we want to see, whatever that want is. And uh, you know me with data, I'd go right back to Kari, Kari um, you know, let's start looking at data and have help inform what the board's going to communicate to the administrators of what we expect. Yeah, and, and I think to add to that data, Steve, I agree, we agree with that, but to add to that the question of data is we know that Vermont is the second whitest state in, in, in the nation, but, and, but the fastest growing population in Vermont is, uh, is 65 year olds. And the only people in, so by two, uh, 2050, our state is gonna look completely different because we do have a little bit uh, enough diversity that those are, that is the population that is growing that is in that range. So that's something us as a district as, as data that is not just the students we have now, but the students that we're gonna be educating in the, in the future. Scott. Thanks, Laura. Um, Stephen, think about data. And um, I'm thinking about Saturday Night Live. Um, I'm sure many of us, maybe everybody, has seen the Adam Drucker skit on Night Live. Uh, uh, if You're cutting off. I oh, recommend it. It's hilariously funny. Um, but the the it's funny but but it hits a, i think an, a really important point um which is that that there's a lot of um there's a lot that's missing in our culture that um is sort of necessary in order to kind of magnetize in order to draw um the people that we're looking for and i, I think that too should, should somehow be factored into the um, uh, into the effort how to how to make us attractive um, to uh, to other people. Jonas. Uh, so I think one of the things that that does make us attractive, and I, I'm glad to see Mia, uh, and I'm also glad that Anna and uh, Towns are still on on here. Uh, me and Towns, I'm sure you remember last year that some of the conversations we had about, uh, you know, overt racism expressed in school led to us taking some action last year that I think the entire board was proud of. Um, I think everyone, you know, a lot of people may have seen the recent coverage of the Vermont Student Anti-Racism Network, 
uh, that has representatives all over the state, including Montpelier and Harwood. Um, however, you know, the board moves forward with this. However, the district moves forward with anti-racism uh, initiatives. You know, those student voices obviously, you know, need to be included. Um, you know, Towns and Mia, you know, started to drive that conversation last year, uh, which was really encouraging. Uh, and, you know, making sure that we're platforming those people, um, I think may go some way toward, um, you know, helping retain those folks. So thank you guys. Um, I just want to say one thing. I think just, I, I appreciate, I think that it is very important to amplify and do everything that you can to support students' voices, but I would, um, not rely on the voices and on the students of color to educate and to rely on them to do the educating for you. It's not responsibility as students and as just a person of color and a predominantly white state and a predominantly white institution to teach and to constantly be asserting their experiences. Of, of course, and apologies if, if that was, you know, apologies if that was no, how you, was you know, thought, thought my intent you know um you know i know that a yeah, lot yeah, of the yeah. members of blam are 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 white people right and um you know we're in a community surrounded no. by <laughs> no the, then the, then the no. the allies and the advocates you know we don't <laughs> my my point is that we have some impressive voices that we have people who are committed to anti-racism yes. on the staff in the student body on the board and in the community making sure that all of those constituencies are represented and brought to the table when we're talking about these things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the last thing that I was looking for from the board, if there's no more questions, is that a lot of school districts, uh, you know, the, the feedback that we have been getting is that a lot of people feel really encouraged by all being a, everybody in the state working towards something that has a, some structure and some grounding principles. So different organizations, uh, not just educational, have uh, uh, given their logos to the Vermont Task Force. As a, you know, I, I've been using my name as vice chair of Washington Central, and I'm wondering, uh, and we don't need to answer the question today, if it would be okay for us to share the logo with the organization as that is something, you know, it had a lot of our administrations, the administrators and superintendent and HR attend this. If you'd be okay with us sharing the logo with the, a support of the work. It, it just means that there's more people um, doing this work. It doesn't mean that, um, it, it, I, don't, I don't know how to describe it. It's just, it's, it's just about support, that's it. Um, I, I'm sorry. I, I'm I'm a little bit confused. Uh, um, I'm not sure exactly what is. Um, are you asking the board so to make you, this or? We we can make it. There there's no action really. It, it, there's no. It, it's not like a formality. I I feel. But if you if if you wanted, we could bring it when we have our agenda prepping. We can bring it up, and then we wouldn't have a discussion the diversified our workforce, we could just uh, see if you would be okay with posting our logo as an organization that is willing to do this type of, uh, uh, this work, you know, that is working. It's, uh, I feel like we are, we don't have all the pieces, but we're working towards it. So we, we can bring it. I don't want to take more time because now I've reached my limit that we had put in for, <laughs> for, for, for planning, but I do want to say that you know I'm really thankful for the work that is being that has been done and continues to be done at a, um, at a U32 at our schools. All of the principals have attended, and it's been really uh, in, impressive to to see. And not just our principals, Kelly and and Jen also attended, and Carla. So, uh, we have a lot to be proud of. So I just I, I felt the board needed to be at that level too. So that was the intent. Of the presentation. Thank you. No, I Thank understood. Thank you for giving yeah. the time. Yeah, that's great. Um, so, <clears throat> okay. I, my sense is that the board feels positively about 
this initiative. Bye, Mia. Great to see you. Take care. Um, Nice. So nobody, uh, nobody objects to, um, to what Floor is, is suggesting, I trust. Okay. Um, so thank you very much again, Floor. Uh, I think we're ready for 4.2, Caroline. Um, okay, so on my screen now, I see Scott, Floor, and Brian. If I get... Um... If my sound gets broken up, can one of you just give me a thumbs down and I'll turn off my video? Thank you. So I just wanted to make sure um, that the whole board was on the same page. I feel like um, it's important for us to understand our superintendent evaluation plan is not finalized. And you know, to me, the idea that we would limit our scope to what we as board members observe directly and what artifacts the superintendent provides, to me, that's unacceptable. Um, we need to put more effort into our superintendent evaluation plan out of respect for our superintendent and our staff and our students and our community. This really needs to be um, broader and more succinct and more clear. Um, and so I really propose or hope that we charge the evaluation committee with, with drafting a plan and bringing it to the board for review. Um, and I think the committee should start with the evaluation plan that was in place um, and existed under our previous superintendent. And that way we're not designing it for a person, but instead for a position. Um, and, you know, I, and I think we can also pull evaluation plans from other supervisory unions around the state so that we're not wasting efforts trying to design something that that currently exists. And I just I, I really felt like what we ended up with did not feel like a plan. It didn't feel um like a comprehensive strategic evaluation at all. And, and I really just want the committee or new members join the committee uh, to go back to the table and get something that our superintendent deserves. Thanks, Caroline. Um, Jill and then Stephen. Um, I just wanna express my support for, um, for Caroline's proposal to continue with the work of really trying to create a formalized and clear process. As I, I agree, I don't feel like we have that. And I also just want to be clear, this is a process suggestion. This is not related to the performance of our superintendent. I, I, so I, I really want to separate those things. Um, but I feel like there's more work to do to have a process that to me feels like a, a you know, true structure. Um, you know, I've been evaluated by a board many times and I, I definitely ha had more structure to it than I feel like we have yet. So I, I just think there's more work to do. Thanks, Stephen. Um, it was my understanding, and I, I could be alone in, in this, that the work was ongoing, that what we have in place now was just the best we could do within a limited amount of time and no one desires to have this method and format going forward, but there wasn't time to develop a formalized plan. So if the, if the committee needs a charge, um, you know, I, I think we can, I would suggest let's just quickly give them a charge and say, continue the work. I, I'm not satisfied with what we've got. I think that was pretty clear last time, but it's, it's just what we can do right now. So I, I say, let's just give the committee the charge. They want to continue their work to develop um, uh, an effective evaluation program for the superintendent position. So I, it, I agree with what, his, what has been. I, I think that we should take this on a retreat as a board. It, you know, we, we had decided on what it was going to be. It was imperfect. I forget the words that Stephen used the last time because I was Hopefully not happy with it. And imperfect. What? No. What did he say? Woefully inadequate. That's the word. Yeah. So yeah, I totally. It's 
really not good. But I, I think that as a board in, in general, we all have to be in it, really understand what that evaluate, what, what we are expecting then. And, and I think it would be worth it for us to spend a little time it really understanding what we want from from this evaluation as as a as a group and it could be a perfect retreat for next summer or before the summer lindy and uh okari were did you have your hand up or no okay lindy first and then whoever hasn't spoken and then back to jill and stephen um i was listening to caroline and thinking about in past years, we had a system of getting input from staff, administrators, community um, that gave more information. Um, I think some people talk about a 360 evaluation, but it was more informative as to what's going on that maybe we don't see or hear. And I think uh, I agree with what Caroline was saying. And I, I think it could be done just looking at what we used to do, because we had a, a data system that we used when we were um, evaluating. So I would like to see that as well. Um, is there anybody else before we go back to um, uh, people who have already spoken? Um, I don't see anybody, so Jill and then Stephen. Um, thanks. Thanks, Scott. So the reason I felt like I needed to say something was because it's not clear to me that that committee is actually continuing to meet or is, has even ever met. <laughs> so <laughs> I just wanted to make sure we were on the same page and explicit or, or, that or, there's or, more or, work to do. Well, I thought there was one. So I, I feel I feel like we got to get clear on that. I don't agree with waiting for a, a retreat and I don't even agree with doing it as a giant group process. I, I don't actually. Evaluations are things that are, I mean, there's lots of tools that, that exist so we could review something, but I really think we need a smaller group to do the homework. If we wanted to set specific goals for the superintendent, then yes, we would probably need to do a full board process. But again, I would not want to do that from a blank piece of paper. I'd only want to do that from some committee work. Just process-wise, I think that would be really hard. Um, just, just for the, um, just to be clear, there is no formally constituted evaluation committee that the board has approved the creation of. It was thrown together ad hoc as a, as a, as a group of um, Caroline, Chris, and myself. Um, <clears throat> uh, Stephen? Well, again, I would cast the ad hoc group of Caroline, Scott, and Chris to continue their work and, and develop a proposal that can be brought to the board. I, I'm fully in agreement with Jill that we can't wait. We, if we wait till the summer to start doing this work, it's gonna be another year where we don't have it done. I'm sorry, but uh, not unique to this board, but yeah, okay. large yeah. boards, we're very inefficient. We spend a lot of time talking about things and that's fine, but we're very inefficient. And if we wanna get something done, we need to start it now and it's impossible for the entire group to start it. Let the small group start it, get some proposals that they can share with the entire board. And that can inform our discussion going forward. Great. Um, perhaps then, Caroline, since you have, um, since you've finished, oh, sorry. Uh, let me do. All right, please go ahead. Um, I was just going to offer, since I was involved um, with two of Bill's evaluations, if I could be of service, um, let me know when the first committee meeting is. I'll, I'll be happy to join you. Thank you. Yeah. I was going to ask if you would. Great. Um, and in the meantime, Caroline, since you, since you have um, ideas, why don't you set them down uh, and then we can work from there? Because uh, again, the, um, the difficulty is um, doing, the worst thing we can do is nothing. Even if we're, we might have the best sort of conceptual evaluation ideas ever, 
but if we don't actually do something, they're worthless. So um, this is <clears throat> why, you know, woefully inadequate even um, is, is okay if it moves us down the road even somewhat. Um, so uh, anybody else? Uh, yeah, are we good? All right, then let's move to the consent agenda. Um, would anyone like to move to approve the minutes of December 16 on page 22? I'll move to approve the minutes of uh, December 16. Thank you, Jonas. Second. Floor seconds. Great. Uh, any changes for Lisa? They look good to you? Great. Um, Lisa does it again. Uh, all in favor, please show a thumbs up. Opposed, thumbs down. I'm seeing uh, George, our... Okay. George, thumbs up. Excellent, thank you. Very good, so unanimous in favor of approving the minutes of December 16. Um, so, which brings us to the board orders and Lindy, uh, I'm thank ready. you. <laughs> um, I make a motion to approve the board order in the amount of $1,041,359.62. Is there a second? Oh, Diane seconds. Thank you very much. Uh, any questions, Jonas? Is that the correct number, Lindy? It's the total. Oh, the total. The okay, thank. Got it. Thank you. Last time she told <laughs> me that was okay. Great. Um, thank you, Jonas, for for checking. Good. Uh, any questions about the board orders? If not, all in favor, thumbs up. Opposed, thumbs down. And I'm seeing all thumbs up. Uh, motion carries unanimously, which brings us to personnel actions. Um, and those are starting on page 28. Uh, would anybody like to, um, to move those? Uh, it looks like there's just one. Is that correct, Brian? Yes, that's correct. Okay. Um, would anyone like to make that motion? I will. I move that we accept the leave of absence request recommended Thank by you. the superintendent. Is that how I phrase it? Yes. Great. Yes. Um, that was Caroline. Um, Caroline moves. Is there a second? Second. Stephen seconds. Thank you. Uh, all in, well, is there any discussion? If not, all in favor, thumbs up. Opposed, thumbs down. And seeing all thumbs up again. Wonderful. Thanks, everyone. Um, any other personnel actions, Brian? That takes care of it? Okay, great. So we are now at public comments. If any member of the public would like to speak, um, it would be great. Sometimes the name isn't always there. Uh, and, and today, it, it doesn't seem that we have um, hand raising capabilities, unless I'm unless I'm just missing something. Um, so uh, please, if you're a member of the public and would like to uh, speak to us at this point in the meeting. Please just uh, clear throat loudly, maybe, or um, make yourself known. I think the raise the hand is under reactions. So on that bottom list, if you click on reactions, there's a raise your hand button. So there is. 
Thank you very much, Diane. Yeah, um, this has changed since last time for me. Um, yeah, I think we all upgrade it, update it. Uh, aha, <laughs> uh -huh, aha, uh -huh. okay. Thank you, Diane. <laughs> yes, you've opened up new vistas, Diane. Um, so uh, any member of the public, once again, um, if you click the reactions button at the bottom of your Zoom screen, there's a raise hand feature. And if you'd like to speak, um, please feel free to raise your hand. And if not, that's okay. We can move on then to future agenda items. Um, we have a few uh, chestnuts in here. Um, the name of the district, at some point we'll get around to dealing with that. Maybe, um, what is, are there any thoughts about this? When would be a good time to deal with this? At a retreat? <laughs> okay. Uh, <clears throat> We can, there's no urgency on this. We can keep it parked for now and, and really. Uh, Scott, I have a thought about it. It's a, it's a, it's a bylaw issue, right? It's a, like an articles of uh, association, yeah. whatever we right. call them. So let's um, parking lot it because we have two other uh, items related to that. One was the size of the board, which we never got around to dealing with. And the other one is the one that Towns brought up about pay which I guess is not articles, but it's, it is governance. And it, it, seem, it seems to me we, we could maybe deal with those in, in a committee in some point in the future. That's brilliant, Kari. Thank you. Thank you. Very good. Um, no objections, I trust. Oh, Lindy? Not an objection. What is our union number now? Oh my. We are number 92. Yep. Thank you. <laughs> I don't understand why those changed when they merged places. So that's, I was asking that because I was wondering who, there is no 32, it just went away. So that seems weird. Um, it actually is still there. Um, it just is used for different reports, but 92 is technically the new number for the entire district. We still have town numbers like Berlin is town number 19 um, and stuff like that. But thank you, Lindy. Yeah, um, learn something new every board meeting. <laughs> uh, okay, um, building bright futures, assessment needs, Brian. I, I was just gonna add, uh, we're, uh, we're, we've been, uh, Jen Miller uh, Arsenault has been starting to, uh, uh, she has been appointed the, uh, lead facilitator for our curriculum management review uh, to work with the uh, curriculum management uh, review team. And there's gonna be, uh, we'll have to have an update uh, for you at our next board meeting. Great, okay. So that's a new future agenda item yes. for the next board yes. meeting, yep. correct? Great. Yes, that's correct. Excellent. Wonderful. Um, where are we with uh, um, assessment needs for building bright futures? So uh, I, I was thinking, I, I I was thinking that's something that we should discuss as a board and be aware of. Uh, and it's basically it's a it's a report of how our Vermont young children's and family doing. Uh, I'll send you the link, just similar to it doesn't need to be at the next board meeting, but I'll send you a link to to the report that is now live, and it also has a link if you want to print your own or you can also request one be mailed uh, to you. But it pretty much gives a picture of the children in, in Vermont age zero to third grade. So, so it's important for us to, to be aware of that, of that data. It, there's gonna be a presentation on Monday actually. So I'll send an email to everybody. So maybe that would be sufficient. Otherwise it would be like, again, like a five, eight minute it chat on on what it is and it's, it's data that all of our uh, principals and administrators actually look at and, and use so it's good for us to know about it that's great so um this is something that the um that the agenda group can actually 
at the appropriate time program uh, for uh, yeah. a, great. Okay. And, and board retreat. Yes. Um, that's another one that we'll, we'll be getting to. Um, and, uh, and Brian added uh, what he was just saying, which has now completely flown through my curriculum management uh, review update. Right. Thank you, Brian. Um, are there any others from anyone? Stephen. For diversifying the workforce. Diversifying workforce. Okay. Note taken. All right. Um, any others? If not, we can go to board reflection number nine. Um, see if, if anyone has uh, a reflection on this meeting or just in general. Diane? We are way ahead of adjournment schedule. So, woohoo! Sorry. Um, we have to make up somewhere, <laughs> somehow, for all the times when we're not. So I, I'm happy that this turned out to be one of them on budget, budget approval meeting, no less. Um, uh, I'm feeling, um, I'm feeling pretty good about this board, actually. Um, I, I always do, but um, more and more with the passage of time. Um, which I guess is a good sign. Uh, others, uh, other comments or reflections to make? Jill, uh, Stephen. Oh, I think you're muted, Stephen. Jill was before me. That's okay. I didn't. I didn't raise my hand. Um, my. I, so my reflection is, um, I, I'm in agreement what was said. Um, I'm really pleased with how the board is working and I'm pleased around the direction we're taking in the, the, uh, the, the funding and the budget. Um, and I, my feeling is we haven't even touched on the difficult parts so for those of you that were uneasy this year, I don't think we've even vaguely broached difficult discussions. Um, so, you know, just, I, I think we just need to be prepared um, as a board and individually and mentally that we're gonna have to tackle some very, very difficult discussions um, in the coming year. Thank you, Stephen. Um, we needed that dose of re uh, Caroline. I thought that tonight's time estimates were extremely accurate. Um, so I just want to thank the agenda committee, and um, I, that is really helpful to um, to having a successful meeting when the when the time estimates are so accurate. It's really helpful. So thank you to everybody who, I, I don't know exactly how it comes together. So anybody who has a part in that, thank you. It's voodoo. <laughs> Thanks. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, um, we miss it often enough. So when, it get, when it's right um, and when it's good, it's a, it's a nice feeling. Um, any other reflections? If not, um, I would just extend my thanks and very best to everybody. Please stay safe and um, stay healthy. And I look forward to seeing you next time when that is. Adjourned by consensus at 821. Thank Happy you. Happy New Year. Happy New Year, everybody. Happy Bye. New Year. <laughs>